We are two away from quorum. Okay, I think we'll get started uh, hopefully soon then. Rami's here. Sorry, right, we're good. Okay. <clears throat> good. So let's um, <clears throat> let's start. So this is the full board meeting for Community Board Eight Manhattan for June twenty twenty one. So thank you everybody for being here, and I see that we are joined by. Uh, one of our state senators, Jose Serrano. So I will turn it over to him first. Hi, uh, thank you very much. And, and my gratitude to the board, to the chair, to the district manager, to everyone um, involved with CB8 for all that you do and for giving me the opportunity to pop by and say hello. Um, as you may know, we have recently completed the uh, legislative session um, in Albany, it was um, pretty challenging when you consider that we're dealing with the pandemic. So, you know, there was a lot of um, really important legislation that I and my colleagues worked on to help us deal with this situation. Um, and a lot of them were big picture issues dealing with the entire state and a lot of local issues that were obviously uh, extremely important to the residents of the Upper East Side and Roosevelt Island. Um, the really scary parts of this pandemic and hopefully um, we're getting to a better place um, now uh, and we can start doing more things in person and out in public, which I think we all we all need and uh, would like to get back to. Wanted to mention a little bit about COVID relief in the budget, um, in the budget that we completed uh, back in early April, we uh, made sure that we used, or we uh, want to use federal stimulus money in a good way that positively affects our local communities. Those have been hard uh, hit the most by COVID. Communities that were extremely vulnerable um, prior to the pandemic, obviously suffered the most during the pandemic. The pandemic also highlighted the health disparities that many communities suffer from, uh, whether it be diabetes, hypertension, all of the things that made the COVID pandemic worse in communities of color um, amongst our senior population. These are all things that we needed to address. So the COVID relief package you know, my hope and my continued work with my colleagues was to ensure that that funding be as, as laser focused as possible on those who needed it the most. Also, as chair of the Committee on the Arts and Culture, um, I felt that that segment of uh, our industry, of our, of our society had suffered uh, a great deal. They were the first to close and are going to be the last to reopen and a lot of our local artists and uh, those who work in the arts and cultural community uh, lost their jobs and, and suffered a great deal of financial hardship. So I think it's important as we look to rebuild our city with the tourism component being a, a critical aspect of that, that we, we enhance and maintain and try to help our arts and cultural community survive to get to the other side of this so that we can we can uh, have the things that we need. Also within the budget, we made sure uh, that the wealthiest in our society paid, the, paid their fair share of taxes. For far too long, um, the, the super wealthy were able through whatever loopholes uh, were there to avoid paying the types of taxes that we needed to sustain our society to help us, especially now that we're recovering financially from this pandemic. So. I'm very happy with the more progressive taxation um, uh, framework that we put forward in the budget. And I hope that we see sort of the fruits of that effort as we continue to move forward. 
Um, we also made some really important legislative uh, decisions as it, as it comes to uh, dealing with criminal justice and low level, uh, low level offenses and incarceration at high rates for low level offenses and trying to make sure that we have a criminal justice system that is fair and unbiased and recognizes the historical uh, inequalities that we have had within the criminal justice system for far too long. So I'm happy to report that in the legislature, we were able to pass bills to move the needle a bit on those important issues. Um, with that, um, right, I just wanted to mention the COVID relief package. We also passed a number of bills that were extremely important for our local parks um, and which also suffered a great deal during the pandemic. The parks got a tremendous amount of use last summer. We saw sort of the beating they got, which is a good thing because people were using them more and that's a wonderful thing, but coupled with budget cuts and other things, it made our parks sort of go through a lot. So we wanna make sure that we can help and preserve them. Um, so with that, I, I don't wanna to continue too long or take too much of the time of the board, but just want to thank all of you for all of the work that you've done. Please feel free to reach out to my office. Um, Terrell Brock is my representative on CB8. Um, many of you have his contact information and we'll put my info and his info in the chat. And if there's any issues that I should be aware of, any events that are going on in the community board that I should be present at or aware of, please let me know. Um, I'm here to help. Very grateful for all the work that everyone on this call and my fellow elected officials on the Upper East Side have done. So thank you so much for having me. Thank you very much for joining us. And your point about the arts is particularly well taken. And we had a, an art show over the weekend, which um, we'll say a little bit more about that was not in your district, but just outside your district. So, uh, and Terrell was there also. So um, in any event, we'll say more about that later, but thank you very much for joining us. And I will add th that on the Roosevelt Island day that we had last weekend, there was such a large arts and cultural component. And you could see that as communities sort of try to recover more and more from the pandemic, we're gonna lean on the arts and culture for not only the tourism aspect that I mentioned, but, but also the emotional recovery that I think all of us uh, are gonna engage in and it's gonna take some time. So thank you for that, Russell. Thank you. All right, we will now move on to the next item in the agenda, which is the public session. So uh, just a quick reminder here that you have until 6.45 p.m. to uh, sign up to speak in the public session if you would like to do so and members of the public can have two minutes um, to uh, to do that and uh, to, sorry to speak uh, in the public session if you sign up and uh, Will will talk a little bit he'll give our usual uh, spiel about the whole zoom process here for uh, for speakers from the public. Yeah, thank you. Welcome everyone. Um, if this is your first time joining us for one of our CB8 virtual uh, full board meetings, you'll notice that you're muted and you'll stay muted throughout the entirety of the meeting, uh, except for if you've signed up for the public session. Um, whenever we get to the public session, Russell will call on names who have signed up. Uh, we'll ask that you use the reactions button at the bottom of your screen and find the raise hand button there to raise your hand when he calls on you so it's easy for us to unmute. If you're calling in from the phone, it's star nine to raise your hand and star six to unmute. Be on the lookout for a prompt asking you to confirm unmuting once uh, Russell calls on you. And uh, you will have only two minutes to speak. You'll see a giant timer up on the screen and you'll hear a beep as soon as it's done. Uh, there is a chat for problems that you're having with the Zoom software. It is only there for doing tech support. It is not to ask questions of Russell or any of the speakers. Uh, they will not see those chats. Uh, if you're using an older version of Zoom, you may need to go to the react uh, to the participant section at the bottom of your screen where you'll find the raise hand feature there. And finally, do not raise your actual hand or wave at the screen. There's a lot of us in the room and we might miss you. Chat me, I'm here for your support if you need anything. I'll pass it back over to Russell. Thank you. So with that, let's go to the first member of the public signed up on the list here, which is Nicholas Sercharo. And just uh, if I mispronounce your name, I apologize. And if you let me know the correct pronunciation, I will endeavor to get it right the next time. 
Hi, uh, thank you. My name is Nicholas Chicaro. I am the Assistant Director of Community Affairs for the Department of Sanitation. So I'm just here tonight to make a quick announcement regarding uh, update to our curbside composting program. So in the fall of 2021, we are going to be resuming our curbside composting program. And in August of the summer, which I know a lot of uh, the community boards are on break, um, August is when we're going to be launching our online form for residents to sign up. So we're not gonna be doing automatic service like we did in the previous, previous iteration. It's going to be an opt-in program. We are gonna be doing mailers. We are going to be doing outreach and we're willing to partner with any elected, with any community board, with any group uh, of residents that want to try and get the word out. But you'll just be signing up on an online form That'll be posted live on our website, myc.gov slash compost. And we'll also be posting about it on social media. So if you already have a brown bin, that's great. If you don't have one and never received one from the last rollout, when the online form goes live, there'll be an option for you to request the bin. If you know of any non-for-profits or agencies that uh, would like to participate, um, we're gonna be doing outreach as well, but. They, they can also sign up and any school that was receiving organics is going to be resuming um, in the 2021 to 20, uh, 2022 year. If you live in a building that you know maybe doesn't uh, want to participate, but you would like to participate, um, we are trying to actively expand food scrap drop-offs. Um, so if anybody has locations where that could be appropriate for that, we're happy to look at that. Again, nyc.gov slash compost has all this information and hopefully we'll see you out in the community and look forward to your participation. Thank you. Next, let's go to Barry J. Kessler. Barry, you can unmute. Barry Kessler. There you go. Uh, thank you. Uh, so I'm here representing the New York Lawn and Bone Club. Uh, we presented to the uh, Parks uh, um, the Parks Committee uh, in their last meeting uh, and discussed um, our efforts uh, with the New York Croquet Club to uh, improve, uh, to, to redevelop the uh, lawn, the Central Park Greens, which are in, currently in very bad disrepair. Uh, and uh, really to uh, invigorate the whole Mineral Springs area of Central Park. So uh, I was asked to, uh, you know, appear uh, in this full board meeting. I don't know if uh, if if the desire is is uh, you know from the full board to uh, present our position again or just to speak to it and uh, answer address any questions that that may come up during their segment. Then I'm here. Um, so it's nice to be a part of the meeting. Okay. Uh, well, yeah. So for the public session here, you've got, um, you know, it's just for folks to speak for, for two minutes on stuff that's coming up. And I think the more detailed uh, involvement with uh, stuff of that nature is going to go on in the committees until sure. we have a resolution on it. So, um, so uh, thank you. And, and uh, I've been in touch with, uh, you know, the chairs of the parks committee about, um, about that issue. And I, I don't think it's going to come up in the discussion um, in terms of having a resolution on it at this stage but um, I know that that's an ongoing item. So in any event, you have uh, another minute here just to sort of, if you want to, you know, talk more about, uh, you know, the work that you're doing and everything. And I think, uh, you know, we'll probably hear more about this as it comes through the Parks Committee. Uh, no, I, I think uh, I think our presentation spoke for itself when we gave it. We, uh, um, you know, we're really, uh, you know, without the proper conditions to play lawn sports, uh, seniors uh, and people with physical disability can't participate and really, you uh, it's, it's really about, uh, you know, making sure we've been in, in Central Park for 100 years. We're about to celebrate our centennial year in 2026. And uh, we want to make sure that we're there for another 100 years and that we have the facilities that can uh, really uh, bring out and be useful for seniors and other physically disadvantaged folks to enjoy the game and to uh, have activities that they can participate in Central Park and, and compete at an equal level. Thank you. And, all right, next let's go to Judith Moldover. Uh, 
Hi. Um, and I think I just. We hear you. Nope, she oh, muted no, herself. Muted. Nope, you muted. I'll, I'll restart your wait, time. Yeah, we'll reset your time. She just, just unmute one more time. There you go. You got it now. Okay, sorry. Um, okay. So I'm here actually just representing myself. Um, but thank you all, by the way, on the board for all you that you do for our community. Um, I'm, uh, I signed up because I would like to improve the appearance of my block. I'm on East 76. Two trees came down. I don't even know how long ago. And that's there's still two very bare spots. There's trash on the streets. In my neighborhood, it's not terrible, terrible, but a lot of people are throwing, you know, when they're eating, they just threw their, their bits of food down. I have two little dogs who can choke on stuff um, and it's probably not good for the sanitation generally. So I'm just here to ask what I can do to help fix these two situations. Thank you. So our, and our, we have an environment and sanitation committee that uh, has been addressing these issues. So you'll see uh, meeting times for those on our, uh, on our website, cb8m.com. Great, thank you very much. Thank you. I'll put a link to street trees in the chat for everybody. Excellent, thank you. Thank you. All right, next let's go to Meg Young. Hi everyone, thank you. My name is Meg Young. I am a researcher at Cornell Tech on Roosevelt Island. And I was part of a group that two weeks ago was invited by Sarah Chu and Sandrea Coleman to the Social Justice Committee part, as part of a coalition that is working to ban facial recognition in New York City. I'm joined in this work by Mutalian Kande from AI for the People and Philip Ellison, who's here tonight from the Office of the Public Advocate. And most of you know that facial recognition software can identify people using photos of their faces, but uh, some people aren't aware that it's been demonstrated to perform dramatically worse on the faces of people of color, especially black faces, especially black women's faces, increasing the likelihood of their misidentification and false arrest. And racial bias in this, these systems is a grave problem, but uh, not the only concern in my research community. That is that even if we addressed these performance uh, issues, a more accurate technology would destroy our privacy and everyday obscurity. Today, someone can take a photo of you on the subway and use consumer facing facial recognition to find out your name and your social media accounts. So the consensus in my field from legal scholars and ethicists and computer scientists is that facial recognition technology is dangerous and should be banned. This has already happened in Oakland, in Portland, San Francisco, Boston, Somerville, and last week in the county where Seattle is located. Uh, tonight, we're here to ask for your help to ask New York City to do the same. And I'd like to extend my gratitude to the Social Justice Committee for the resolution they passed that they'll be sharing with you tonight. Thank you very much. Thank you. All right, we've been joined by one of our council members, Keith Powers. So we are going to turn it over to him for a report. Hi, everyone, and thank you, Russell, and thanks. Nice to see everyone in the different squares. And I see my uh, my state senator uh, colleague here, Serrano. Nice to see you as well. And uh, I want to mostly stop by first just to say hello and welcome some of the new members here to the board. Uh, I know there's a few new folks, but I want to give a special shout out to two that I have added to the board officially here. One is Rami Siegel, who... Um, Probably got one of the most outstanding set of reviews I've ever seen of a potential applicant, and I see him on my screen right now. Uh, so to get him on the board, I know is uh, uh, exciting and uh, really glad to add him. And then also um, my friend Evan Meyerson, who actually was on CB5, so has a little bit of experience, but lives up in CB8. We wanted to get him into his neighborhood and been doing a, really a slam dunk job uh, on CB5. So you got two people who have a little bit of experience here that come uh, highly recommended. And of course, many other members that are joining the board. And as a former CB6er, I'm sorry to tell you, I was just 
on a different board, but I love CB8. Um, always glad to see folks signing up to help serve their community and their city. Um, so thank you and welcome. And uh, glad to hear, see their perspectives and experience brought to the board. Um, I just wanted to also add a couple of things. Of course, uh, Violet from my office is here as always. So any issues that um, the board's dealing with, you can always reach out to her, but wanted to give some updates tonight. Um, one is um, we're doing a lot of talks, you know, about small businesses and restaurants and how to make sure that we're doing our duty to save them. And last week, we actually heard a number of bills related to the, the mostly about deliveries, third party apps and delivery workers last week. And one of the bills that I have that's actually um, we work with that restaurant industry is is about third party apps and that we've done a lot in the last year to kind of regulate the fees and provide a better experience for all the restaurants that have to deal with them. But one of the things we've been hearing from some restaurants is that they want better access to the ability to sort of manage and their marketing and get better access to data about how the restaurants are doing. So I actually have a bill in the city council we heard last week that would give restaurants better access to information from the third party apps about their customer data, their ordering, uh, give them a better opportunity to market to their own constituents and also get a better sense of how they're doing. Um, so we're actually working with some of the, the hospitality alliance and of course the third party apps too to come to a final bill that we could pass that would make it as we come out of COVID a little bit easier for restaurants to get their data, know what who's ordering from them, what they're ordering, where their hotspots are, where they could be doing more uh, marketing and to actually have a better sense of how their, uh, how their restaurants are doing. So we're actually going to hopefully pass that in the city council. We've heard from a lot of restaurants that that would be a really good tool to sort of get an economic boost and do a better job strategically marketing themselves. Um, second is I uh, want to thank CBA. We did a, a, a successful virtual event on ranked choice voting uh, about a month ago, and CBA and others joined us for that. Um, we are in the throes of early voting and, of course, ranked choice voting with an election coming up on Tuesday. So um, it was timely to do that. But also, we still are getting a lot of questions about how ranked choice voting works. So if you see anybody who's still trying to figure that out, we can, you can send them to our office and we'll give them the presentation talk them through how it works. And of course, uh, I see Lori holding up her I, I voted sticker. I pre, I, I, I'm i glad they still get the stickers out because even when it's on different days, it's a kind of a badge of honor, I know, for a lot of New Yorkers. Um, so we're going to be doing, um, a, you know, try to do a little more education for election day. So if there's anybody who is uh, still trying to figure it out, let us know and we will be happy to give them more information. And I want to, again, thank CB8 for joining us in that. Um, two more little small things here. One is we're in the throes of the end of the city budget process, which is supposed to be due here at the end of the month. Uh, I am on the budget team. So we've been doing a lot to try to get the pieces put together with federal stimulus money, looking at the economic recovery and how we're doing. And of course, get a final budget put together. I have to say, um, A, to uh, Senator Serrano and the state colleagues, they did a really kind of amazing budget at the state level, probably one of the best budgets they've done in a very long time. Ever. And um, that also took a lot of relief off of uh, He's laughing. It's probably ever. And uh, he, and um, it actually took a lot of relief off of our plate, too, when it comes to like school funding and other items that they picked up. And also, I have to say, Senator Schumer and the feds did uh, just an absolute home run, getting us FEMA reimbursements, getting obviously money directly to the workers and getting us stimulus funding for about over five billion dollars that really filled the gap in our city budget. So uh, we're trying to get uh, more money out to places where it's needed. We're also trying to get community boards a little more funding funding in that process as well to do all the work that you do. But we are uh, hopefully by the end of this month, we'll have a final budget and have something to announce to New Yorkers about uh, our recovery budget here. And the last thing I wanted to add is we are facing a blood shortage, which we have been for a while um, in the city. And we're going to be doing a blood drive next week at the June 24th, uh, which is a Thursday. And we're going to send out information. But if you want to, I'll be getting, giving, donating blood. But if you want to uh, join us in that, um, if you're like me, when I worked for State Center Liz Kruger, I passed out while giving blood. Don't be me. Um, but, uh, but you can certainly come and join us. We'd love to have you. We'll send over information as well. So um, with that, I just wanted to say thanks as always to Russell and everyone for all the work that you're doing. 
And of course, I uh, hope if I don't see you, you have an enjoyable summer and stay safe and vote and get vaccinated and all that good stuff. Thank you. Thank you for all the work you're doing. Yeah, thank you. All right, next we will continue here with the public session. So we'll go next to Philip Ellison from the Public Advocate's Office. Hey, good afternoon. Pleasure, pleasure to be here. I'm really, <clears throat> I know my time's uh, starting. I'll be brief, but uh, one, um, it's a pleasure to be with you. And I'm actually participating in the public session alongside my colleague, uh, Meg Young, uh, who spoke earlier at the Cornell Tech DLI, the Digital Life Initiative Research Lab, uh, as well as uh, the city leader, national leader on these issues of AI and race, uh, Mutali Nakande from AI for the People. And I'm just simply here to kind of, to reinforce and share that, you know, there is some cynicism around um, decentralized technology like facial recognition in our city. That's a wide network of cameras and, and a suite of technologies that is able to map our, our faces and identify who we are, as you heard from Meg. And saying that, you know, the Public Advocates Office has um, really been support in our Ban the Scan campaign with Amnesty International that this is, an this is a national issue, it's an international issue, and in that when you look at, for example, Staten Island, you know, the, we came out at, after being astonished that the Staten Island District Attorney was using Clearview AI, a company that has, you know, millions of photos that are just taking them off the internet and uh, allowing the Staten Island District Attorney's Office to basically do things that they're not supposed to be able to do. So I use the example to say, you know, who's policing the, the police, who is policing or over doing oversight? You know, we don't want to let this get too far ahead before we take a look, before we try to reconcile these tough issues that have real hardcore implications for um, people of color, LGBTQ plus people who, people with disabilities, people who do not uh, present atypical, I really just want to give my thanks to the Social Justice Committee for their courage, for their intellectual rigor and moral conviction to reconcile a tough, a tough issue and look at facial recognition and policing. Thanks so much. Have a wonderful evening. Pleasure to be here. What a great, uh, great group of people at CBA and congrats to the new members. Thank you. All right, next, let's go to Liz Daly from the Frick. Okay, thank you, Russell. Um, good evening, everyone. I'm Elizabeth Rose Daly, the Community Relations Manager of the Frick. Um, I'd like to first off say thank you to both Council Member Powers and to Senator Serrano for your support of the arts. Um, I would also like to um, congratulate uh, Community Board 8 and especially the Arts Committee on a very successful show this weekend. Um, I was able to stop by and I'm very glad that I could. So um, great start. Uh, I would just like to remind you all that the Frick Collection is now at um, 945 Madison Avenue uh, at 75th Street, the old Whitney building that many of you may remember, um, which was more recently at the Met Warrior. We'll be there for about two years. Um, I hope that you will come by and see our collection. It's an opportunity to see the, our works in a completely new light, um, what we are calling reframed. Uh, it's not only our paintings, but you'll also see our sculptures, especially our bronzes, uh, works in the decorative arts, um, pieces that are not normally on view, such as the Mughal carpets that we have um, from the 17th century, um, and you know some long stored canvases that are in the Fragonard series, um, The Progress of Love. So I invite you all to stop by at the Frick. We are open Thursdays through Sundays from 10 to six. And that's it for me, thank you. Thank you. All right, let's go next to Andrew Ravishir. Hi, Russell, thank you for letting me speak. And thank you to the whole board for holding this forum and letting me speak. I was so thrilled to hear uh, State Senator Serrano talk about a fair tax code and the rich paying their fair share because we're seeing an analogous 
concretized version of that in our real estate market where we are continually seeing the rich get richer. We're seeing a proliferation of these super tall, monster tall uh, greenhouse gas emitting luxury buildings at the expense of affordable rent stabilized middle and lower class housing. There has been the demolition of several blocks of affordable housing and there's more demolition proposed this time on First Avenue between 85th and 86th. As we know, these monster tall buildings above 210 feet emit an exponentially greater amount of greenhouse gas emissions than smaller buildings. And they also contribute to the urban heat island, which I know when I speak about it sounds like a, a fringe topic or a wacky environmental concept, but it's so mainstream that CNN recently just covered it on June 2nd, and they've been saying what I've been saying for months, which is that the increased temperature impacts communities of color uh, even greater than the rest of us. So. Um, I am speaking about all this because I'm hoping that the city, in terms of its new administration, will address these concerns and they'll help our community enact a 210 foot height cap and other communities do the same. But I'm also talking about the climate change harm because climate change is a subject that is under the jurisdiction of New York State. And so State Senator Serrano, I am open and willing to work with your office. Remediation on monster tall buildings is not enough as we saw with the greenhouse gas emitting building uh, in Midtown that was supposedly clean, but because of the machines of the city uh, bank building, it actually polluted more than anticipated. And so I'm here proposing that we all work together to accomplish the goals that we want, which is a 210 foot height cap. Thank you. Thank you. All right, next let's go to Wendy McIver. Can y'all hear me? Yes. Yep. Oh my goodness, it's wonderful. My new button worked right away. Thank you so much. I'm probably going to double down on what Andrew Ravisher said. This is a very important meeting because coming at the end of the spring and before the summer break and also before uh, the final day of our local primary elections, uh, it's very important to focus on the development and overdevelopment issues. Under the 14th Amendment of our Constitution, municipalities are given the rights to enact zoning regulations. And we have enacted zoning regulations that have helped us to a great extent. Third Avenue and East are looking to have the same protections as the uh, avenues to the West, to have a 210 height cap on the avenues and to preserve our 75 foot height caps in the middle. And I have to say, if there was a vigorous uh, uh, enforcement of these regulations, then I think that some of the work of Community Board 8 would be able to refocus on other in incredibly important issues. Instead, again and again, there are challenges um, because we don't give clear guidance to developers who then feel, and rightly so, that it's unfair that they are uh, not granted the same exceptions as their fellow developers. And developers shouldn't be made the enemy, they should be in partnership with us. Um, a notable case, the Penn Central case in 1978, which is the controlling case still to this day, still good law, uh, was a, a case about a proposed 53 story building on top of Grand Central Station. And it was considered really the question was raised as to whether this was a an unconstitutional taking of the rights of the developer to have all of that wonderful space up the top, uh, on top of Grand Central. It was not. That's the law. They're allowed to make regulations. And I'm really proud of CBA's work to try to work for the, the people who live here. If you walk around and you pull, you pull the people who are here, people do not want overdevelopment. It is absolutely proper to interfere in uh, uh, zoning issues when there are issues of uh, race, creed, color, religion, uh, disability. This is not the case when you just have for profit uh, cut, cutting down uh, various uh, low income, middle income housing uh, for no good reason, for no need for housing. Uh, the model of training hype for uh, neighborhood amenities does not work, has not worked over 40 years. Thank you so much. Happy Thank summer. You. All right, next let's go to Lo Vanderbach, our Yale neighbors. Am I, am I unmuted? You yep. Are. Go ahead, Lo. Okay. My name is, uh, my name is Lo Vanderbalk. I'm representing Carnegie Hill Neighbors and I'd like to speak to an item that will be voted on this evening uh, during the part of the session that covers the landmarks uh, items. Concerns uh, an apartment building at the corner of Madison and 91st Street. Its name is 15 East 91st Street. And it concerns um, opening up 
a previously enclosed um, balcony space. Um, there are currently, there are current, there's currently no uh, master plan for the balconies, but there is a master plan for the windows. This is uh, this uh, uh, this balcony, which is currently enclosed, as are all of the other uh, six uh, uh, balcony windows of that line, which is the extreme western line towards. Uh, towards Fifth Avenue. So all those balconies originally existed when the building was built in 1947, according to the design of the architect that's also known for the Sherry Netherland. Uh, they were open, but at, at some time, and we know from photographs that this occurred before 1990, they were all closed, possibly as early as 1980. And therefore there is a consistency. We would like to, Carnegie Hill neighbors position is slightly altered from the meeting, is we would, we would not disapprove this, except if the building develops a master plan for the, for, the, for the opening up of the balconies and this forms a part of that master plan. Um, I hope that will be taken into consideration. Thank you. Thank you. All right, next let's go to Edmund Lee. see him on here. I do not see him on here either. Uh, raise your hand uh, by going to the reactions button if you're Edmund Lee, or if you're calling in from the phone, it's star six to raise your hand. Oh, there he is, iPhone. iPhone, uh, you can unmute if you're Edmund Lee. Hi. Hi, uh, can you guys hear me? Yeah. Okay, so uh, I basically applied for a uh, a waiver to my 30 day notice for uh, my restaurant's uh, liquor license renewal form. Um, basically, uh, this is like my fourth time uh, applying for a liquor license renewal. But this year, obviously, it was a little different. And normally, we're supposed to send a uh, 30 day standardized notice form to the community. But obviously, the uh, office was closed to COVID, I believe. So I, I wasn't really sure where to send it. So I sent it to the uh, liquor authority, which was not the correct thing to do. So they ended up telling me that, uh, that I, I needed to still send a standardized notice form, but I realized that you guys allow for a waiver and uh, I was granted one. And uh, the stipulation was that uh, I would have to ap appear before this meeting. And uh, here I am. Thanks, so can you just talk a little bit about the application, basically, just sort of briefly what, uh, you know, what if any changes it entails, what the, which restaurant it is, what the nature of, uh, what kind of license you're looking for. Oh, just yeah, sorry, I'm representing, uh, okay, yeah, I'm representing uh, Iso Hama Japanese restaurant in the Upper East Side. Uh, normally, I hand deliver the, uh, the standardized notice form to the community, community board's office, but uh, this year, obviously, they were, or whatever, and, uh, and I was unable to do that. So I applied for the waiver and uh, got it. Okay, I mean, we've been open remotely, but okay, so the, it's a, is it a liquor license or a wine and beer license? Yeah, liquor license, yeah, full liquor license, yep. And it's a renewal or a new license? Renewal. We Are already any... got the, we already got the liquor license. Are there any changes? Nope. No changes whatsoever. Okay. Um, and you were invited to the uh, Street Life meeting earlier this month and you just, you didn't attend, is that correct? No, I was actually here, but I, I didn't realize I was supposed to speak. So yeah, I was, uh, I guess I was just muted, sorry. Okay. Um... All right, anyway, yeah, so this will come up, I guess, at uh, the Street Life Report, so, um, okay. Okay, is there anything else you guys need from me? Did, was there, did you post before this meeting? Uh, no. Okay, um, yeah, so the way it works is if you're um, coming before us, you have to 
posts in the area of your restaurants that folks who are in the community know um, that if they want to come and speak and comment on it, that they have an opportunity to do so. So you need to post notices uh, uh -huh. around the, res uh, the, the restaurant. Okay. Uh, that did you, part did you post prior to the Street Life Committee meeting? No, that, that part, this part is, uh, was unclear to me. I, it just said that I had to appear like uh, in the email that was sent to me from Murat. And what, what restaurant was this again? Iso Hamo. Okay. Um, yeah, cause the, yeah, the stipulations or the conditions of the waiver are appearing before the Street Life Committee um, and acknowledging that it's a one-time waiver um, and, sub and just submitting and writing the reason for, um, for the, the missing um, or not filing on time. So I appreciate you being here. So I think that will, um, that does actually meet our, our, the, our three conditions by your appearance and speaking here. Okay, great. Uh, thank you very much. Okay. Thanks. Do we have any other questions, Abraham? Or are there other other things we should uh, cover? What we think? no on this one. This was a straightforward. No changes. Um, uh, liquor, wine, beer. Uh, so again, the, the waiver was granted um, based on on those conditions, and then um, the applicant just had to come uh, in person to um, just verbally explain. So. Okay. All right. Thank you. Okay, thank you. All right, that is it for the public session. So let's move now to adoption of the agenda. Is there a motion to adopt the agenda? And you can do that with a thumbs up. Rami. Okay, is there a second? Uh, Sandrea. Excellent, any opposed? I don't see any hands. So the agenda is adopted. Next, we will adopt the minutes. Um, and just one point to note here, as I mentioned in my email, you know, these are the, we're adopting the minutes, not only for our last, uh, you know, our May normal full board meeting that we have, we also had an extra meeting in May, our uh, special meeting of the board at which we passed the resolution on the blood center. So that's part of those minutes also, as I noted. So is there a motion to adopt the minutes? Which again, you can do with a, uh, Thumbs up, great, Anthony, I see that. Is there a second? Yes, Rebecca Dangor. Let's go, I see Rita has a hand, so, oh no, Rita was gonna second. So I don't see any hands in opposition, so the minutes are adopted. So let's go next to the Manhattan Borough President's Report. I don't think Gail is here, is Isabel here? No, Isabel is out this week, but I did see Brian Lafferty Brian from Lafferty. her from her office. So Brian, okay, are you Brian. delivering the report or is uh, the borough president attending later? Uh, the borough president will be attending shortly. Sorry about okay. that. Okay, well, we'll be ready for her when she gets here. Um, and in the meantime, we can do other uh, elected official reports or we can start those. So if uh, the elected official representatives will raise their hand, I believe we will call on you in order of you yes. raising your hand. So I see Jack Robbins first. Hi everyone, uh, I'm Jack from Assembly Member C. Wright's office. Um, just a few updates on some upcoming events that we're having, um, just reminding everyone to vote early. All of us worked hard to get three additional sites um, for our community here on the Upper East Side in Roadsville Island. Um, and so there shouldn't be any crowding and we haven't heard any reports of uh, too long of lines. Um, so early voting is still Thursday, Friday, Saturday, and Sunday. And then um, all poll sites will be open on Tuesday for election day for our uh, primaries. Um, so just make sure to get out there and vote. On June 20th, this coming Sunday, um, we will be hosting a Shredathon with Upper Greenside um, at the 92nd Street Green Market from 10 a.m. 10 a.m. until 2 p.m. So bring your papers and documents that uh, you like shredded and recycled. Um, additionally, our uh, bi-weekly housing legal clinic is still going on. Um, our next one will be June 22nd. And our 50th uh, virtual town hall will be on Tuesday, June 29th at 6 p.m. 
Um, we will be talking about the challenges uh, that small businesses are facing and resources available to help them. Um, here in our community, we will have a deputy commissioner from the Small Business Services of New York City um, and um, other speakers as well that we are um, locking up here. Um, and we hope that you all join us and, and spread the word. Um, I will, of course, put my contact information down in the chat, but for anyone on the phone, um, you can reach the assembly member's office by calling 212-288-4607. Thank you. Thank you. All right, next, Rebecca Grigas. Hi, good evening, everyone. This is Rebecca from Assembly Member Dan Court's office. I hope you're all doing well. Uh, for my report tonight, I just have a few pointers. Uh, one session came to a close last week, and out of the pool of bills the Assembly Member introduced this year, one of them, uh, which would extend the co op and condo tax abatement program for another two years, passed to both houses of the legislature. And hopefully it will be sent to the governor's desk soon and then he will sign it, which is, you know, good news for a lot of folks in our district. Um, the emergency rental assistance program opened up application last week for folks who um, meet certain requirements for assistance. And then on July 1st, applications will be open to those who need assistance and they will be accepted if money is still available in the program. If anyone is experiencing issues with applying, or with the application process, feel free to reach out to our office. And everyone knows early voting has begun and the primary election is next Tuesday. And I think like Jack said, if anyone sees any issues going on in the district um, with polling sites, you know, how things are being handled, you can also let us know. We'd be happy to step in and figure that out. I will put all of my contact information in the chat box if anyone has any questions, comments, or concerns. And that's all I got. Thanks. Thank you. Next, let's go to Jeremy Lockett. Good evening, everybody. Um, I know this is definitely another introduction for myself. Um, I'm with the Manhattan DA's office, the Community Partnership Unit. Um, it's good to be here. Um, I have a couple of announcements, but um, I do want to say I was I was on a call with um, CB8's uh, Women and Families Committee last night. I won't speak for them. I know that Miss Price um, is on the call, and I can probably see that there are others, but. It was a great conversation related to domestic violence in Manhattan. There were great panelists. Um, we had an assistant district attorney uh, from our special victims unit, as well as a supervisor from our witness aid service unit. Um, I'm sure they can share some information on what's gonna come of that. But um, one thing that I would just like to put in place, um, I, I tried to put in the chat yesterday and I couldn't unmute myself, um, but we are, are available. Um, I am a liaison to uh, the support staff in that, in that office, um, whether you're a witness or a victim or just have a question. It could have been something that happened to a family member, um, a friend, um, just feel free to reach out. You do not need to have an open case. You don't need to call 911 to be, um, be working with us. Um, so I'm gonna put my information in the chat, um, but a couple other things. We just finished um, actually a hate crimes poster contest for middle schoolers. Um, we'll be announcing the winner soon. So I don't know exactly who uh, submitted throughout Manhattan. They kept that from me. I tried to have some, some say, but um, I will be announcing that probably at, um, well, I don't know if there'll be a next month's meeting, but I will share that information for sure. Um, the winner in the school gets $1,000 for initiatives um, for anti-hate crime initiatives again. Um, one thing that's going on with us, we're still supporting is our Saturday Night Lights sport programming for youth. That's free, 11 to 18 year olds, and that's Friday night and Saturday nights. Um, right now it's basketball and soccer. In the past, there were other things like dance, uh, volleyball, um, arts. We're trying to expand that, but um, COVID and some other things definitely took a blow. Um, but that's that's something that's going on right now. Um, my time is up, um, and I just want to say if everyone can, some of the people here that are new to me, put their information in the chat, whether it's your email. Um, if you, if you give us your email address, yeah, we'll put that in that. the chat, and we'll, we'll get it out to folks. So they Appreciate it. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. All right, next is Audrey Tannen. Hi, everyone. Um, welcome to the new community board eight members and hello to our old friends and partners. Uh, very quickly, uh, we are going to be having a summer town hall about confronting our own biases. And Liz hopes it will be a very interesting and formative discussion and reflection that's gonna be on July 8th with faith-based and community leaders. 
Also, just quickly, uh, she's looking forward, the Senator is looking forward to joining your congestion pricing task force on Monday. So uh, we hope that she'll not only get the chance to speak with members of the task force, but also the public and other community board interested in the, this very important issue. That's pretty much it. We just kind of ditto what a lot of our colleagues have already said this evening. Have a good evening, everyone, and have a good June 19th. Thank you. Next, Abby Damsky. Hi, everyone. Um, ben will actually be on later to give the report. Um, I just wanted to let everyone know that this is going to be my last full board meeting. I am leaving Ben's office in July. Um, I am very, very sad to go, but excited for what's next. So I really just wanted to let everyone know and, and say thank you. It's been really wonderful getting to work with all of you um, on so many different community issues. And I'll be around until July, but this is my last full board meeting. So just want to tell everyone and say thank you. Well, Abby, we're sorry to see you go. And uh, thank you very much for all your help with everything over the years and for joining us in so many of these meetings. And uh, we wish you the best. Thank you. Thank you. All right. Let's go now to the chair's report. So I have a few items to talk about. First of all, I want to echo what uh, others have already said. And I, I think this is, you know, we had our land use meeting last week, but this is our first, uh, you know, official sort of full board meeting for our new members who have joined. So it's Rit Agarwala, Ima Toma, Evan Meyerson, and Rami Siegel. So uh, it's very, very glad to have uh, uh, you guys here with us and uh, join the board. And we're very excited to, uh, to, to have you uh, as part of our work here. So um, the other item that I wanted to mention is unfortunately we, um, our assistant district manager, Max Vandervliet um, has, uh, has left us. He's gotten another job doing um, planning related work. He's gonna be the assistant director of planning at uh, different uh, municipality in New York state. So we are very excited for him in his new opportunity, but I just wanted to say on behalf of the board that, uh, you know, we're very sorry to see him go after uh, all the good work he's done here on our behalf. Last thing is I just want to mention that we had a very, very successful program over the weekend, the um, art show that we did, Art on the Ave, uh, that was spearheaded by the Arts Committee. And um, it was really a wonderful event. There was great turnout. We had fantastic local artists. We had really excellent music. Uh, including from local students at uh, uh, Talent Unlimited, and I think possibly other uh, areas. I just want to say thank you to everybody who participated in particular. I want to thank um, Alita, who's the chair of the Arts Committee, Alita Camp, for uh, really leading that effort and, and getting that organized. And uh, I should say also Max was a big help, but also other board members who were very active in uh, helping put that together, you know, I know Rita Popper played a huge role and um, Gail Barron was assisting and uh, Peggy Price and uh, some other folks. And actually I see Alita has her hand up so she can uh, say a little bit more about uh, that event, which was really a great success. Thank you, Russell. I wasn't really intending to, but I do want to thank all of the committee members because it involved a lot of work. It's kind of like having a baby. The, all the work that goes into it, um, you forget how painful it was after you have it and it's successful and you're ready to do it again. Um, so that's, that's how I feel. And thanks to all of the people on the committee and the board members and people from the elected officials offices and the community, the response was more than enthusiastic. So um, I hope that we'll be able to do more and that more and more people will turn out but everyone from the artists and musicians to the community were pretty much unfailingly um, enthusiastic about it and supportive. So thank you for the opportunity, Russell, and for letting me speak now. Sure. And thank you, Gail, Peggy, and Rita. I will second Russell on all of that and Max. Yes, and I know, and I, I know Mrs. Brown had been involved uh, at one point, and uh, and Wilma was uh, actually got to display some art. So I just want to. Uh, and I, you know, I'm probably leaving some folks out for which I apologize, but I just, uh, it was a great group effort and hopefully a harbinger of many future successful similar events. So with that, uh, let's go to the district manager's report. Uh, thank you, 
thank you, Russell. Uh, I'll also echo all the welcomes to the, to the new board members. Uh, you will see you have a great team uh, that you're a part of, and there's a lot to learn. And I just want to uh, always remind that uh, myself and Saida and our board office are here to be resources. If you have questions, if you need any information, uh, if you just need to know what, what's going on. Uh, don't hesitate to reach out. You can always email or call us. Um, I also wanna echo the applause for the uh, arts event uh, this weekend. It was fantastic to see all the engagement we got um, online and, and in person uh, from the artists. And the, all the artists were so excited uh, and posting about it on, on Instagram and everything. Uh, so that was very exciting to see. And so congratulations to all the, the board members and. Uh, uh, folks who worked on that, uh, especially Max. Uh, Max put in, uh, I don't know how many hours working on that. And uh, just want to say thank you to him if he's watching. Um, and just, you know, as Russell mentioned, he's, he's gone. We're sad to see him leave. We're very excited for his new opportunity in New Haven. Um, and uh, we're excited uh, that the hiring freeze is over too, so that we can be fully staffed again and start looking for uh, new, new staff members. Um, I'd also like to applaud Saida, who this month celebrated two years working in our office. Uh, her contributions are fantastic and she should be applauded. Um, and then finally, I'd like to just remind committees who will be meeting in July uh, to send us their agendas as soon as possible. Thank you. Thank you. All right, let's go now to the committee reports uh, and we'll start with the Landmarks Committee. So David and Jane, take it away. Thank you, Russell. We heard um, three applications on this past Monday evening. In 1022 Lexington Avenue was a unanimous disapproval. We had heard an, applica um, an application on this um, address, 1022 last October, which I believe was approved. They came in with a new plan because there's a new um, tenant, a restaurant at that location. And um, along 73rd Street, which is basically a residential block, there would be approximately 70 feet of plate glass going down to the um, ground, doors that would open out. But the committee felt it's a historic building um, and that the window should have a little more distinction, should have perhaps divided lights. And then the infill was inappropriate at the corner. Does anybody want to comment on that? It was a unanimous disapproval. So no one, Will, has a raised hand on that? No, no hands are raised right now. Question so can I be called can by, uh, call, uh, the question. call the question, yeah. Okay, all in favor? So I think we can go to a vote. I see all those thumbs up. Okay, and for our new board members, I just want to remind you that this is an, a disapproval, so your, net, your yes is a no to what they applied for. If you would like to vote no, abstain, or not vote for cause, please raise your hand. Rita? I forgot to take it down after seconding. Okay, I'll give everyone another 20 seconds. All right, the resolution passes unanimously. Thank you so much. Um, the second resolution was 15 East 91st Street. I know Lo Vandervoort spoke about this application during the public session. Very interesting application um, for the reinstatement of one of the his original balconies. So many of them have been removed. It's kind of a nondescript brick building, but in an exquisite location at the corner of um, 91st Street and Madison Avenue within the Carnegie Hall Historic District. The committee, it was a unanimous resolution in favor of the reinstatement. It was a little bit complicated with the windows behind the balcony that'll be um, realigned and reconfigured. But we felt it was just very exciting. Um, these balconies have sort of ocean liner streamlined railings, which are very distinctive. And we felt that the the building should come up with a master plan for the um, 
balconies. It has a master plan for the windows. And I know Lo spoke to that um, previously. So this was a unanimous approval. So any hands raised, Will? Michelle Birnbaum. Go ahead and unmute, Michelle. Yeah, I just wanted to say I fully support them uh, re returning to the original balcony. These balconies have been enclosed and it's been pretty much our practice in our committee that if we have an opportunity to return um, architectural features to where they were originally and with the original vision of the architect, we take every opportunity to do it. We do understand, and this happens with windows as well, that it may take some time for things to actually revert back to how they were originally, because these proposals come often one apartment at a time. But um, the general feeling is that it's worth doing that because eventually you do get a returned, a building that is returned to its former uh, glory and to the intent of the architect. And also, um, when you close up a balcony, you make an interior, you make an exterior room, like let's say it's off the living room, and you make a room out of that balcony, you've now made that living room an interior room without windows to the outside. So I'm often puzzled about why people might want to do that, but they do for the extra space. But returning it to how it was and opening it up to me was the right decision. And so I hope the rest of the board will support it. Thank you, Michelle. Any other raised hands, Will? You got Marco Tamayo. Marco, go ahead. Thank you, oh, Will. Thank you, Jane. I would like to call the question. Is there a second? Uh, is that what Alita and Rita are, have their hands up for? I guess all those in favor. I'm yeah, and Rebecca, like, Rebecca seconded in any of Okay. Case. I think we can go to a vote on this. Yep. Okay, great. Um, I'll, I'll take this one. And uh, so if anyone, in this case, uh, a yes is a yes. So um, if anyone is voting against, um, uh, not uh, abstaining or not voting for cause, if you could raise your hand. Seeing none, just a couple more seconds. Okay, seeing none, this um, this resolution passes um, unanimously and it appears sort of uh, 41 to nothing. Thank you. The uh, last and project. And I'll just, uh, sorry, David, for the record, the last vote was 41 to zero to zero. Last project was 1083. Fifth Avenue. Um, I don't know if it's possible to put up the visuals. Uh, if not, I can describe it. It's fairly simple. This is a very beautiful townhouse that uh, is being totally restored quite beautifully. And this is not the right. This is the, uh, oh, yes, this is the right one. Okay. Um, so what we're seeing, well, that's the, um, the reason I wanted this first is you, this is the, uh, north side of the building. Originally, the north side of the building was supposed to have been covered by another townhouse. However, uh, that never happened, and we now have the church on the corner, and we have space like a view corridor between uh, the church and the building. So this secondary wall is all of a sudden visible. So if you look at the top on the left, you see the white uh, area, which is the top of a bulkhead, which is the bulkhead, which is the top of the stair, uh, which had to be added. It was a fire stair when this became an institutional building. That fire stair uh, remains, but on top of it, actually it doesn't remain. That fire stair is going and a new elevator is going in and on top of it, on the right hand image, you can see that they're putting uh, the top of an elevator or an elevator bulkhead. And that's seven foot three inches high above the original stair bulkhead. Uh, which you can go to the next slide, please. In any event, what's happening, and let's look at the right hand first. Originally, uh, the stair bulkhead was white stucco, which was very visible. Uh, the blue box is the new proposed uh, elevator bulkhead. Uh, what's happening is that uh, you can see that vertical line sort of uh, 
uh, towards the end. And that vertical line is a formal light well. That formal light well has been closed up. Uh, it's all being uh, integrated into the restoration. And all of the brick that was used in that light well was reserved and the light well was closed up on the side. And then the rest of the brick together with some uh, matching brick, new brick is being <clears throat> integrated and used to carry that brick wall all the way up the building, replace the stucco and to build the penthouse in that same red and brown brick. So if you look to the left, uh, the photo montage, uh, you can see uh, how the building looks <clears throat> with the uh, new elevator bulkhead. Uh, I think we all felt as a committee that uh, this very small addition, uh, which was rather minimal, uh, uh, was inconsequential. There are some uh, intermittent views from Engineers Gate and from uh, and from the track, but it's very little and it's fairly far back. And it does look as if it's part of the original wall since it's made up of mostly the original brick. So this was a unanimous approval <clears throat> that this was an appropriate uh, way to in incorporate the new elevator penthouse. So I don't know if anybody has any comments or questions. <coughs> Looks like Marco has his hand up. Marco. Thank you, David. I would like to call the question. <coughs> Got a second. Looks like Michelle is seconding it. So, and Rita's seconding it. So, please call the roll. All right. So, let's lower the hand. And if you would like to vote no, abstain, or not vote for cause, please raise your hand. <coughs> Seeing none, the vote, uh, the resolution passes 41 to zero to zero. All right, thank you. Yeah, thank you. Wait, okay, next let's move to the social justice committee. Uh, it's Andrea and Sarah. Hi everybody. Um, Sarah Chu and uh, Sandrea Coleman is my co-chair. Uh, as you can hear, I'm a little under the weather today, so um, I, <laughs> uh, I'm going to do my best here. Uh, first, Andrea and I would like to express our thanks to Max for all of his support and for the very kind, gentle reminders to get our materials in on time. So thank you, Max, wherever you are. Uh, on the 24th, we had a um, meeting where uh, we had we um, uh, had presenters um, on the scale and scope of surveillance technology. We were so lucky to have Mutali Nakande, a computational social scientist who's also the CEO of AI for the People come, uh, Dr. Meg Young from Cornell Tech a digital life initiative and Philip Ellison, who's also part of the same initiative and um, and uh, part of the public advocates office. And they gave us an amazing presentation on, on how digital surveillance technology has an impact on our lives and it's, um, and how it disparately impacts black and brown communities. Um, as part of the presentation, I would um, I, I would really encourage everyone to uh, watch their presentation on YouTube. Um, but if you don't, please uh, look at our minutes. We have links to um, Band Scan, which is a film that they presented. It's a short film um, that uh, focuses on the local advocacy by the Brooklyn Tenants Association who organized against the use of facial recognition technology in their buildings as well as links to Coded Bias, which is a documentary on Netflix about facial recognition and a link to the 60 Minutes episode on facial recognition. Uh, we do know that uh, the 60 Minutes um, episode omitted um, interviews with the black women scientists who discovered and raised awareness uh, about the racial disparities in facial recognition technology. Um, so, uh, after uh, the fantastic presentation from 
uh, these experts, we came um, to a resolution which was approved unanimously in our committee. And it calls, the result calls for city and state legislators to take action to regulate algorithmic and AI technologies. And in the resolution, you'll see in the result that we have kind of seven criteria for how we think that that regulation should take place. And so I'd like to open it up to the floor for folks who would um, like to comment or who have feedback about the resolution. Also, I'd just like to chime in um, before we do that. Um, we would also like to welcome new board members on board. Uh, welcome uh, to Community Board 8. Um, this will be um, great for you all and a great experience as it is for all of us. Um, yes, and, and a reminder that this resolution is very important. Um, AI, artificial intelligence, um, although it's great for the modern world, the negative impact, as Sarah said, for our black and brown people um, is just so unjust and so unfair. We need to uh, make sure we raise awareness and hopefully our legislators also will get on board uh, to get some, uh, some things in place to protect uh, the people that it negatively impacts. Um, that's it. Um, who's, so you have uh, Jane, Rami and uh, Kaz, you have their hands up. Okay, um, Jane. Oh, thank you very much. I'm just curious, the bill, which seems to be extremely all encompassing, um, who exactly is it gonna be sent, our resolution, who will it be sent to? I mean, our locally elected officials, who else were you gonna direct it to? Um, we're, we're directing our resolve, our resolution to both city and state legislators. So would that be every single city legislator and every single state legislator? Um, well, I guess for the uh, for the application of this community board that it would be uh, within New York State. So New York City and New York State. I think very okay. often, I'll just observe, I mean, very often for um, things like this, you know, we'll send it to the legislative leadership. Oh, okay. I'm just confused by it. It's pretty all encompassing. So I was just curious about how it was going to... Um, you know, whether it would really have an impact. Um, but thank you, I appreciate that, Russell, thank you. Thank you, Rami. Yeah, so um, I'd like to thank Sarah and Sandrea for uh, the resolution, but also I attended the presentation technically before my term started as a new board member, um, but I definitely echo um, Sarah's statement uh, that everybody should go watch the presentation. It was pretty enlightening. Um, it just makes you think about all of the data that is collected by city and state agencies about individual citizens um, and how that can affect um, our district specifically um, with congestion pricing coming up uh, as well as the new uh, Metro car technology. Uh, so I would just like to be on the record supporting this resolution. Uh, and I would also like to call the question. Um, I can't see if there's a second. Oh, I'm sorry. So my hands just went up, it looks like. Uh, yeah. I assume there's seconds. Okay. Remember, you can use the thumbs up icon for seconding, and it then doesn't make us think that you want to speak on the topic. Okay. Um. So. Yeah, there's there there. These are seconds, or or among okay. them are some seconds. Lauren. So more than seconds. Lauren. Okay. So the question has been called and it's been seconded. And um, so we can go to a vote. We can go to a vote. Okay, um, just one uh, small correction, uh, which is that we are not 41, we are now 42 and, um, and we're for all the first three votes. So all three votes were 42 to zero to zero. Okay, um, anyone who is, voting 
no abstaining or not voting for cause, please raise your hands. I see cause, if you could unmute him. Go ahead, cause. Yeah, I had a couple of questions uh, concerning things that, you know, I want to clarify that the question's being called, so I'm going to go abstain on this. Okay, thank you. Um, anyone else? Um, uh, Mrs. Brown? So you can unmute Ms. Vega. Yes. Can you hear me all right? Yep. All right. I had a question previously with regard to the resolution being sent to the state legislators as well as the city. And I'm asking the chairs to consider sending it to our federal legislators, senators and uh, House of Representatives, specifically uh, AOC and uh, Kirsten, Joe Everett and Chuck Schumer. I think it's important that they know the work that you are doing and hopefully they might want to adopt that and strengthen it. Thank you. And also I want to um, commend chairs for the outstanding work that they're doing in social justice. Thank you for your time. Thank you. Sorry, can we just yeah. confirm that you're voting yes? Mrs. Brown, if you'll unmute to just confirm that. I am voting yes. I am supporting the resolution. Okay, so I'm now going to try Elizabeth Rose. Abstain. Abstain. Okay, thank you, Elizabeth. Um, and I think uh, that's it, um, which would make it um, now 41. Um, to zero to two. So thank you, the motion carries. Great. Thank you very much, thank everybody. You. Thank, thank you. you. Okay, next we will go to the Youth Education and Libraries Committee. So we'll go to the co-chairs, Taina Barrero, Peter Patch, and Rami Segal, who uh, is a Officially a member of the board now can take his place here at the uh, full board meeting to uh, help lead the discussion for the committee. Thank you, Russell. Um, okay, let me let me just briefly uh, mention the, the session that we had with uh, Professor Jennifer Klein from Hunter College looking at learning loss associated with COVID and and really a brilliant presentation about the, the steps we, we and can and need to take in order to uh, uh, support our, our kids. Their primary focus is on, on uh, teaching kids with disabilities, so it's very useful. Rami also is going to present a uh, resolution that we, we uh, discussed uh, and passed, uh, focus on after oh, sorry. Meeting, uh, sports activities. So Rami, you want to pick that up? And then, and then actually at the end, I want to mention a joint session we're planning a week from Monday with the Social Justice Committee. Do it, do it, do it before you could do that now. Okay. Um, well, I mean, I, I, I have to pause a little bit because I, I, I feel so much passion and concern about our kids coming back from COVID, but especially our, our kids at risk, our black and brown kids, uh, our kids at, at Isaacs and home centers. And so, uh, Sandrea and, um, Taina and uh, 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 Sarah and uh, Rami and I have been talking about how we can not only look at what the issues and challenges are, but get input both from you members of the board and from members of the community, especially from Holmes, Holmes and Isaacs Towers, parents and kids to look again more deeply at what the nature of the challenges, challenge is, but also what we can do to address it. Um, and, and hopefully perhaps even create something like learning centers through the NYCHA facilities, including at Homes and Isaacs Towers. 
So for any of you that find that you know important and compelling, very much ask, request, and invite you to join us a week from Monday for that joint session. Rami? Yeah, so we had a resolution in May. Uh, there, there, there's wording in it supporting after school programming as a whole, which um, across the board has been cut due to the pandemic. A lot of after school programs went virtual, but now with vaccines, especially for students 12 and up, uh, I, I'm not a medical expert, but medical experts have said that after in-person after school programs can return. Um, there's also more specific wording in the resolution that discusses a, um, the process in which the public school athletic league, which governs a lot of high school specifically sports, um, and they're and joining new teams. So if I'm a school and I will, a new school that doesn't have a soccer team, I want a soccer team, I have to go through a process to get that approved by the Department of Education and the Public School Athletic League. Um, and currently there's a policy in place that stops uh, new schools from gaining new sports teams. Uh, and so the resolution discusses um, sort of a repeal of that policy um, and supporting schools specifically in Education District 2 and in CB8 um, to get any sports teams they want uh, approved uh, by the PSAL. Uh, I know that other community boards would be interested in this. Um, so I, I think this is so, sort of a citywide, but more specifically a Manhattan-wide issue uh, with the DOE and the PSAL. Um, so with that, I will open it up to questions. Uh, I see Jane. Oh, yes. Welcome to community board eight. Hopefully okay. we'll all meet in person and get to meet each other. Do you have any statistical information on exactly how many schools or groups have requested these teams? So That's my first question. My second question is, um, who exactly is the resolution going to? I know I asked that about the previous um, revolution from the Social Justice Committee. These are such broad-based issues. So to answer your first question, I worked with uh, liaisons from the parents' associations uh, in both Eleanor Roosevelt as well as the Clinton School, which I am a student at. I'm at the Clinton School. Um, and unfortunately, uh, the only information we were able to get out of PSAL was um, sort of that they had this policy. Uh, it's not really public information. Any uh, schools were just stumbling upon this policy uh, when applying for new sports teams. To answer your, but Jane, I, I'll, I will reach out again to our <coughs> Yeah, because it would be interesting to have some real facts here, you know. Yes, yes. Um, and to answer your second question, uh, our elected officials are predominantly our city elected officials. Uh, we'll CC the chancellor's office, uh, Chancellor Porter's office, um, as well as directed to the, uh, I believe it's the PSAL commissioner. That's the head of Public School Athletic League. Um, so we'll direct it to his office. His name escapes me. Um, well, I think, um, you know, I might have to abstain on this because it's, it's, we need some, I think, firmer information, but thank you so much. Thank you, Jane. Uh, Michelle? Yeah, thank you, Rami, and welcome. Good to have you aboard. Um, so my question is this, what's the criteria at the moment that the PSAL has when a school comes to it and asks to create a team? Why is it that we're getting, why is it that it's difficult to get a team? What is their criteria? And, and why is it difficult to meet? So my, my understanding of this process is that um, there's a policy which prevents I, I think I think they have quotas by district. This is what I've interpreted from their communications to parents' associations, um, which prevents them from 
uh, incorporating new teams from schools that already have sport teams. So for instance, Eleanor Roosevelt ha has numerous sports teams, um, but the Clinton school only has one boys basketball team uh, and a few girls sports. Um, my concern is that in school, in newer schools like Clinton, um, this uh, exacerbates the gender gap in sports, uh, which which uh, is is definitely predominant. Um, it's it's really hard to nail down specific information from PSAL. Well, is it financial? I mean, is it? That I, they I, don't... I think part that's definitely an aspect. Is that is that? So where do the funds come from? Money? If it's mainly a financial thing, where do the monies come from for these pro for these after school sports programs? So PSAL gets budget directly from uh, the Department of Education's bu um, budget, but I believe they are supplemented um, by other city agencies, but I'm not 100% sure about that. Um, yeah, well, you know, uh, of course I'm in favor of this. I mean, I don't know who, you know, you can't be against it as a concept for, for schools to have more teams that are wanted if they want it. So of course that's a good thing. Um, I'm going to support it, but I really wish I had a better understanding of the process here and what are the pitfalls that would make it. Uh, we could address it, I think, in a in a better way than uh, just saying this without like we want more sports team. We want anybody who wants a sports team to have a sports team. Well, yeah, yeah, I could say that about a lot of things in the city, which can come to be. So I'll support it. But um, if you can get us some some follow up information, just because I think it would be a good idea for the board and the board office to have it, uh, I would appreciate that. Yes, uh, when we send the resolution, I'll make sure to include uh, some more questions in a letter. Maybe we'll get different communications that way. Opposed. Well, to that's a good idea. Let's let's liaisons. do it maybe with a letter. Yeah, because uh, if all the chairs are, are okay yeah. with that, to put a letter on the resolution and you know requesting that we are approving it in concept, we'd like more information. Okay, thank you very much. Good solution. Thank you, Michelle. Uh, yeah, so we've been in contact with community liaisons, but maybe from the commissioner's office or the chancellor's office, there will be some more finite information. Uh, I see Elizabeth. Hi, um, I can actually help answer some of the questions that people have been asking, um, at least from the perspective of uh, three years ago when I was at the DOE. Um, the single biggest issue is funding um, that the PSAL has far more applications every year for new teams than it can afford to fund. And their approach has been not to take any teams away from schools that have sort of above uh, average number of teams or um, relative to their enrollment. Uh, and consequently, the number of teams, new teams that they're able to start is extremely limited. They um, made a lot of progress in getting to gender equity over the past decade, uh, although there is still room to go there. And I think they also have some real issues with racial equity in that, for example, you know, in the past, the criteria for new teams included things like, does the school have uh, the physical space to uh, support the team in their practices and in their games? Um, and does the school have someone who's willing to coach? So sort of school capacity issues. Well, the buildings in the city that are most able to support uh, multiple sports teams are on Staten Island and in uh, the more suburban-like parts of Queens. So they do have some gender racial disparity issues in award in sort of the number of teams that exist. Interesting to note, PSAL is the only high school after school program that is centrally funded at the DOE. All other after school programs are funded at the school level. Um, and so that's another reason why PSAL is extremely popular. It's basically more money for schools. Um, all of this um, does add up to, frankly, there are probably programs that are less effective at the DOE uh, than funding more sports teams would be. 
Um, and so this is something that um, I certainly support. There should be increased funding uh, so that the opportunities to participate in sports can be more equal uh, across all of our schools. But there frankly should also be funding for drama and school newspapers and other after school activities because not all schools can afford them for all students. Thank you, Elizabeth. Um, I, I hope that cleared um, some of those questions up for board members that have asked. Uh, I see Rita. Welcome to the board, Rami. I just wanted, Title IX was a very hard battle and I just want to be sure that it's still in effect, whereas, uh, of course, you were talking about inequality between girl sports and boy sports. That, that was the equalizer. Is it still in effect? Yes. Um, so schools apply for new sports teams on a need basis. So a school will say, hey, I have 25 girls that are interested in starting a soccer team, um, or, or a better example, I have 25 boys that are interested in starting a soccer team, uh, can we get an approval for that? Uh, that doesn't necessarily mean there's, a, there's enough interest uh, from girls or vice versa um, to create a soccer team for, for one gender uh, or both genders. Um, there are some leagues, so so for for student uh, for schools that were not able to secure a PSAL sports team but had interest, um, there are like charter school leagues that have been expanding. Uh, but there's a downside because the travel. Um, but that's all. There's also a gender gap in that, as that some of these um, outside leagues. Um, they only have just for boys or they just have a league for girls. Um, but Rita, that is definitely a concern, um, uh, especially with, with these PSAL teams. Thank you. I see Elaine. Welcome Rami. My concern as I listen is that many schools collaborate with CBOs in the community to allow for after-school programming. And in fact, in most communities, it is funded through DYCD. And you may get, whether it's the midnight basketball teams and, and they're gonna come back uh, as crime has increased. But my concern is I'm confused. We've got Title 10, you have equity for male and female teams. You cannot have one over the other. The funding has to be equal. That's one issue. But my other concern is for the community, the schools in our neighborhood, how are they working with the local CBOs, whether it's Lenox Hill Neighborhood House, and I don't know what they have, or Asphalt Green that was originally set up to subsidize and work with the schools in the community to provide sports. So I understand the dilemma. I understand that the, the Board of Ed has limited funds, but most funding for after-school programs are not through DOE. They're through DYCD. So I don't know what homework has been done here, but I'm concerned having run after-school programs for 35 plus years in multiple communities, working with DYCD, I just don't understand what resources and capacity has been delivered or worked on with the schools or those who want after school programming. So I've got real concerns here with what you're identifying as a program because there's a lot more to do. It's not DOE that really funds, there is, funding that comes from the state, the city, to do the after-school programming. And many, many of the after-school programs uh, that are available or should be available should be tapped by the local schools in the neighborhood. So can you tell me what the schools have done? 
So on the high school level, as, as Elizabeth said, um, PSAL is centrally funded. So any money that comes from the federal government, so that's American Rescue Plan, um, from the state level, the recent state budget that's earmarked for after school programs, um, is actually sent to the DOE centrally, which then sends it to PSAL or the other after school programs it um, runs. A lot of after school programs, as Elizabeth said, again, uh, are school based. So PS290 uh, and a lot of other elementary schools fund their own after school programs um, on the elementary level. Uh, on the high school level, going back there, um, all of that money gets divvied up. So for some years, there might be more money than others. Um, and what PSAL has said as a policy is that they really do not want to take away sports teams from schools that already have charter uh, sports teams. So for my school, right. we're a basketball team uh, and they're chartered. And let's say PSAL got zero dollars, they would try not to, uh, they would try to whatever they can in their power to get us a sports team. Uh, that sometimes you're right, they are privately funded. Um, so elementary school programs, a lot of them are privately funded. A lot of them are not done through um, school specifically. So I know PS290 has an in-house one um, and they bring in outside programs. So they'll bring in um, the, one of those ma math tutoring companies. I, I know from 10 years ago when I was there, they had uh, a math program come in to teach math. Uh, now, my, my question is, what have our schools in our community done to work with local CBOs, DYCD, and look at what the needs are and then put a proposal in because the Department of Education is not going to fund all this. It comes whether it's the, uh, God, I can't remember some of the acronyms, but you, you have the Midnight Basketball, it used to be called the Beacon Schools. There are a range of programs that can come into the schools that the school has to work with the community and then work with DYCD. These are not federal or state. These are local city funds that will increase in the coming year given the COVID. So I would suggest that your committee look at with the schools what is going on with the city funding that's available out there. So Manhattan Youth is another organization that's funded at the middle school level. Uh, that's in all, all middle schools in our district. Um, so that's Robert Wagner and I believe two others. Um, and they, they get city funds. They get city dollars and they, Manhattan Youth is a not-for-profit organization. Um, other organizations that middle schools work with and the DOE works with are uh, Steady Buckets. That's a basketball program. I, I think that that's one of the programs you were work, uh, you were um, you mentioned. Um, but Elaine, I can certainly reach out to the schools to see if they're they're working with other private institutions. Um, Elaine, I believe you're muted. Please do. There are funds there. Maybe the community has not reached out appropriately, but across the city, there are a range of different funds, Beacon School, after school, community schools, and it needs to be looked at, which means that the school administration has to have a commitment and willingness to work with CBOs. I have to tell you, a lot of the schools did not want to work with CBOs because they didn't want outsiders in their building. So you need to look at this and push your schools to do this. High schools, middle schools, elementary, there's a range of different funding that is available. And, and you're correct. But the, the issue here is specifically with the centrally funded by state and federal dollars and some city dollars to fund the Public School Athletic League, which is the central, which is officially sanctioned by the DOE. Uh, and it's a DOE organization. They're a branch of the DOE. Um, uh, I'm gonna turn it back over to Elizabeth. I see there are other hands, but perhaps she can provide some uh, more guidance. I, I actually just wanted to offer a, what I hope is a friendly amendment to the resolution. 
um, that uh, you, you do recognize in the resolution um, that you're saying that the current policy exacerbates the gender gap in sports. Um, I think that you wanted to, in your, in your be it resolved, I would just like to offer a friendly amendment that says the charter of any of teams interested in participation in it, PSAL approved sports in keeping with gender and demographic and parity or equity across schools. Uh, I, I, I do think that, that one of the arguments against just letting any school who wants a team have a team is that wealthier schools can pay for their own teams and poorer schools or schools serving lower income students generally cannot. And that is one of the challenges that PSAL has. So I think if there were a way of just recognizing that expansion of teams uh, must maintain gender and um, demographic parity, uh, I think that would help. Um, do my co-chairs have objections to that? Because I support that. Totally fine with that. Totally fine. Thank you, Elizabeth. Um, uh, I see Michelle again. Taina here. I'm fine with that too, Rami. Yes, I too. I too would um, would like to make a friendly re, uh, amendment. Um, first of all, I, I think it's a good policy not to take teams away from those schools that already have them, no matter whether or not there's an imbalance, because we certainly don't like to take services away. So I would, I'm glad that that's a policy that they wouldn't do that. However, I think maybe can we put in one of the whereas is something about the funding that we're asking for more funding, but also that we're encouraging schools to reach out to um, uh, neighborhood organizations, in some cases to the PTA. I know that there are PTAs in the city who have actually funded the salaries of teachers. Uh, let's say they wanted a specialty teacher, a music teacher, whatever. Now I, I recognize that can't be done in every school because the resources are not there. However, there are um, community members uh, um, a business that may want to sponsor a team or, um, you know, a, another league or something like Asphalt Green or other community. But I, I wonder if we can put all that in a resolution and that will be our way of having an affirmative resolution without having all of the financial details of the existing funding source. Do you know, because we're saying, well, we don't know how they finance. So if we can just put something general in the whereas is about the financing, that we want the financing increased by the DOE for this. And, but we also want to encourage schools who want teams to reach out to com private community organizations, PTAs, any other wording that you think would be appropriate to put in there. So is there an appetite for that with the board and the co-chairs? Yeah, so on the third whereas clause, um, I mentioned that it's been cut due to the pandemic, but I think what you're asking is to expand the wording on that to be more inclusive to just non-pandemic related funding. I'm sorry, um, Remy, you faded out for me, so I couldn't hear what you said, uh, if you wouldn't on the, mind. On the third whereas clause, um, the, it reads, uh, after school programming funding has been cut and programs canceled due to the COVID-19 pandemic. My understanding of your friendly amendment is uh, to make that more, to broaden that into non-pandemic funding as well, right? Yes, to broaden that and to say we would like funding, um, pre-pandemic funding plus. Uh, we can't say pre-pandemic funding because at that point there wasn't enough funding for all these teams anyway, even at full capacity. So we want to say 
we don't even have to mention the pandemic. We can just say we want increased funding substantial enough to um, honor the requests of more schools who are looking for team for who would like teams funded, and we would also like all these all the schools and uh, to reach out to community resources, PTAs, neighborhood businesses and corporations, etc. Um, I so if you want to use it in that, whereas and reword that, that's fine. I certainly accept that, Peter Taina. All good. All good. Um, yeah, so we partnered with um, members of PTAs and uh, school leadership teams to actually investigate this matter from both Clinton and Alvaro, as I said before, um, jo just so we can get a, uh, from a school-based perspective, both of those uh, parents' associations as well as their school leadership teams um, have, are committed to after-school programming um, as well as sports teams. And they're, they're, they're working just as hard um, as individual students and, and coaches to, to, to get to the bottom of this and, and to really figure out what, what's, what's going on. Um, so Jane, I see your hand is up again. Jane, you're muted. I'm now unmuted. Thank you, Rami. You're really getting your baptism by fire. I think we should table this and let it go back to the committee. I think the discussion has evolved into what the work that really should be done at the committee level. There are too many whereases, it's too confusing. So that would be my recommendation that we not have a vote on this tonight. I also want to thank Elizabeth for lending some clarity to a very, very complicated scenario. So uh, that would be my recommendation. We can't write the resolution all over again here at this meeting tonight. Thank you. I don't uh, it's to, Peter, if, if you want to help me with the procedural stuff here. Um, I'll uh, say it's up to you guys, sorry, just to weigh in. I mean, it's up to you guys whether you want to do that or not. If you want to just take the, to the extent we've gotten some friendly amendments, if you want to just keep going forward with it, we can, um, we can do, I think it's just a judgment call of whether uh, we think we're going to get a lot more substantive discussion or with given the friendly amendments that we have now, we can, you know, move ahead, but uh, go ahead. Rami, I'd like us to try to proceed with the friendly amendments we have. I, I agree with that. Um, uh, uh, go ahead, go ahead, Rebecca. Sorry to jump in procedurally. I think if the motion is on the floor and there's a second, we have to vote on it. All good. I'm, and if you, I'm, I'm okay with going ahead. And I appreciate your comment, Jane. Okay, so is there, so we, I guess we have to see if there's a second for the motion to uh, table. There were. Well, I'll withdraw it. I'm happy to withdraw it. I, you know, I just think it's crazed. I mean, I think it's a question of whether there's going to be out from my own perspective. Uh, you know, I think if we're going to get a lot more discussion over friendly amendments or, or people suggesting additional amendments, then I think, you know, maybe it's, uh, you know, it's, it's getting to be sort of too long on it. But, but if we're, you know, with those amendments, we're sort of getting to a point where we're ready to, to vote on it. I think we can you can also do it that way. I, I'm sorry, I'm sorry, Jane, but I see, I see one, I see Elizabeth's hand is up. Uh, now there's more, but I, I, I would like to proceed uh, to vote tonight on this issue. And because, because I know that the Department of Education is beginning their budget process for 2021-2022 uh, school year. Um, and if, like, look, it's June, school's two weeks now. Um, so Rami, if I can add a brief comment, I mean, the, the sense of the motion is to, is to look for increased funding and make this more available across schools. And, and frankly, it did, I don't think even if we got additional information on what sources of funding are available, that would either change the sense of the motion or, you know, what we're trying to see happen. I, I, I am a little concerned with the number of hands up. So hopefully, you know, if there's substantive issues that people want to raise, that's fine. Otherwise, I would certainly be open to the notion of going ahead and voting on it with the, with the uh, amendments that have been proposed. So you have Chuck Warren next. Okay, am I unmuted? Yeah. I'd like to call a question on the uh, amendment, uh, on the resolutions on the floor. Let's... 
And Rebecca Tangor is second. Okay, I'm gonna lower all the hands. All right, if you would like to vote no, abstain or not vote for cause, please raise your hand. Jane. Abstain. All right, next, uh, Elaine Walsh. No. All right. And next we have uh, Barbara Chaffee, who I think is trying to clarify her vote. Barbara, you can unmute. I unmute. Okay. I, I abstain. Okay, great. Um, cause? No. Police? I just was getting a little confused as what we were voting on. Are we voting on um, the resolution to table this or the resolution is proposed? No. The Jane resolution. withdrew her motion, so it's the resolution. As okay. amended. All right, then, then I vote yes. Great. Anyone else? Seeing none, the, uh, oh, Wilma Johnson. Wilma, you can unmute. I was trying to do a point of information because I would like to know exactly what are we voting on as far as resolutions because it was the five things that um, came out, but I'm not sure of what we're voting on right now. So it's point of information. Before you vote, before you started voting, I want that uh, uh, clarified. Uh, Rami, Rami or Peter you, yeah, Taina, sure. do you want to? So it's the resolution that was in the materials um, with um, Michelle's amendment that expands the third whereas clause, which says uh, after school programming has been funding has been cut, um, just to uh, expand the word in there to make it more broad. Um, and there is a second friendly amendment. Um, Peter, do you have the word? Yeah, the, the friendly amendments, the first has to do to ex extend it to include the uh, uh, focus on gender and demographic uh, equity. And the other uh, was to um, encourage mm -hmm. schools to look out to local funding sources, including uh, community-based organizations. Otherwise, okay. The motion as originally written. Yeah, All right, thank you. Like you. To vote no or vote yes or abstain? I'm not really sure because I had a lot of questions to ask about that. Um, you know, and um, I just have to, um, I'm going to abstain right now. Um, when I get okay. more information, um, I can uh, make a better decision because it's just too confusing. Okay. Lori? You're muted, Lori. Lori, just please unmute. Hi, can you hear me now? Yes. Um, I was just gonna ask a question about the friendly amendments because it gives me pause to um, tell- Lori, I think if the- if the question is about what's in the friendly amendments or what the subject is that we're voting on, then, then that's an acceptable question. But if it's a question of what should go into them or something along those lines, then we're already voting. For no, no, I'm just, I'm just, I'm just asking a question about what's in, you know, I think, I think that I have a problem with some of the amendments is what I'm saying. So um, I think that I should <coughs> abstain. I'm sorry. Okay. <laughs> I'm going to abstain. All right. <clears throat> Uh, Valerie? Yeah, I'm going to abstain. Got it. Uh, I'll give everyone like 10 more seconds. Uh, if you would like to vote in a different way. All right, seeing none, uh, the motion passes, but I will get you a full uh, vote total. 
shortly. Thank you, Rebecca. Thank you, Russell. Thank you, guys. Thanks, everyone. All right, let's move now to the Roosevelt Island Committee and Lynn. Am I unmuted? Yes. Ah, okay. So first I would like to welcome again the our new board members. And I would also like to welcome uh, Paul Krinkler, who is now a public member of my committee. And um, we have a resolution that has to deal with the MTA at our subway station. Um, when we were under very, uh, uh, when, when the city was going through the challenges of normal transportation and everybody was trying to get into work and those kinds of things in the morning. And then when we had uh, events on Roosevelt Island, we were finding that there was an issue with uh, the problems in terms of the way that our subway station is currently constructed. Whereas people leave the station and enter the station from the same exit and this causes a lot of problems within um, safety in terms of getting in and out of our subway station. So we have brought a, uh, a motion, I'm sorry, a resolution that um, we add uh, through the MTA an additional subway entrance, uh, turnstiles and uh, ADA compliant door that mirror, uh, hopefully mirror what we already have on the south side of our station onto the north side of our station. We've been referring to it as the Starbucks side, uh, just to give people a reference point, and that we would like the MTA, uh, because right now what it is is a glass wall, we feel that it's a very uh, inexpensive relative to MTA costing and issues, an easy fix that will be valuable to our community going forward as Cornell uh, grows out and we get new, uh, the last building, uh, apartment building built in our community. So we would like to get in front of those issues before those things happen and work with the MTA to make that happen. Um, I'm uh, proud and happy to say that uh, uh, our council member Ben Kalo supports this as do, from what I understand, many of our other elected officials uh, because they realize that it, is, it relates to safety for our subway station. Um, so do I have any questions? Rita has her hand up. I don't know if you can see it. Yes, so I'm having a problem seeing it. So uh, yes, uh, unmute Rita, please. Hi, I think you guys are doing a great job. I don't really have a question. I would like to call the question. Should, uh, well, actually uh, I'd like uh, Sharon from our committee to speak first. And Sharon then... seconded. I'm sorry? Sharon seconded the call the question. Oh, okay, well then, <laughs> all right then. Um, the question has been called and um, we need to vote. So if you could take that from me there, whoever's doing the vote for us. Yes, Rebecca? I'm doing this one, I think. Oh, okay, Anthony. And um, so anyone voting uh, no, abstaining or not voting for cause, please raise your hands. Give you another couple of minutes here, seconds, maybe not a whole minute. Okay, um, so the uh, uh, the motion is approved uh, unanimously. I'm not sure what the exact number is now. I think it's 42. Um, and yep. uh, and I'll go ahead. I'll read the the vote for the youth education and libraries resolution. It passed with a vote of 35 to two no's to five abstentions. So thank you, everyone. I greatly appreciate that. This is a, a safety issue for us, a little thing that's super important. And thank you so much for your vote this evening. 
Thank you very much. All right, let's move next to the Transportation Committee, Chuck and Craig. Thank you. Thank you, Russell. And uh, I'll also welcome the new board members. And uh, it's great to have you here. And I hope you'll enjoy your tenure. We have two resolutions. They were both unanimous. Um, I, I, th I think I'll ask Craig to explain the first one and I can, and I'll explain the second one. I think Craig is. Sure. Uh, and before Craig, why don't you go ahead? All right, thank you, Chuck. And I'd also like to welcome our new members as well. Um, the first item was a presentation by Sam Schwartz regarding a proposed concept for what he's calling a Queen's Ribbon. It would be a pedestrian and bike bridge that would connect Queens and like the East Midtown area in general. It's only a concept in that he has been looking at this for a long time. He has a proposal for essentially six of these bridges connecting Queens, Brooklyn and New Jersey to different parts of the central business district. So basically Midtown and lower Manhattan. So this is one in particular that we were discussing was the one that would uh, um, be connecting, let's say the Long Island City area to the East Midtown area and crossing likely over Roosevelt Island. So this is still a, a long ways away in the best case scenario, it wouldn't be constructed until the end of this decade. Um, but as Sam Schwartz put it, the, the motivation for this is with the increases in biking and even with the additional bike infrastructure that's going in on the Queensboro Bridge and Brooklyn Bridge, um, there's, we're gonna run out of capacity based on the increase in demand over the course of the next decade. And we're gonna be able to um, benefit from, from such a potential bridge. It would have to undergo both um, local planning studies along with federal environmental assessments and so on and so forth. So there's a lot to go. So this, so he was emphasizing that this is really just a concept um, that he was putting forward um, to provide, it would be a 20 foot wide bridge, 10 feet dedicated to pedestrians, 10 feet dedicated to bikes, five feet in each, each direction. There would be some cutouts on the bridge that would allow for pot potentially benches or places where people can just recreate and enjoy the view. Um, and we made an, uh, we emphasize in the resolution that we would want to see a direct connection from Roosevelt Island if the bridge was in fact to go over Roosevelt Island. Um, there are no specific locations for a landing area um, in the East Midtown side. It would likely be somewhere along the East River Greenway, but again, those are the things that the planning study and further design would, would hash out. Russell, did you, did you have a I just had a question. Yeah, I mean, that was, an, and uh, I think Craig touched on it a little bit, but I just, you know, my question is sort of where is the idea that it would, um, or, or what's the sort of foreseeable impact on green space on the, you know, on the, along the East River and the, you know, also the FDR Drive is, is my first question. Then my second question was just if you could clarify about whether there would be an off-ramp on Roosevelt Island. So in terms of, uh, let me start with the off-ramp. Um, the, the drawings that he provided um, didn't necessarily depict one, but he emphasized that it would be um, a priority to have, whether it be a landing or an elevator that would provide the access to Roosevelt Island. But we in our resolution included language specifying that we would wanna see a direct connection to Roosevelt Island to allow people to um, get from the ground level up onto the bridge. And in terms of impacts, again, this is something that um, we didn't get into details because that's what the planning study would actually look at and, and, and furthermore, the, any environmental assessments that would have to be done would look at that. As he discussed, it would likely be a landing that would um, be part of the East River Greenway project that's now taking place. Um, as you know, they're gonna be um, constructing additional space um, in the 50s. And he can envision different ways in which it could connect to, to that. Um, but the 
idea in terms of open space, the bridge itself would, as I said, have potentially a little open space um, for people to be able to um, take advantage of, and it would provide linkages to other open space, obviously, in other um, areas as well. Thank you. Lynn, I guess, Lynn had her hand up. Can we unmute Lynn? So I, I, in the 30 years that I've been on Roosevelt Island, um, this is a topic that has been discussed multiple different times. Um, one of the biggest issues with uh, doing some type of bridge is the traffic on the, is the boat traffic uh, on the East River and in the corridor between Roosevelt Island and Queens. Um, one of the reasons why the bridge that goes from Roosevelt Island to Queens is a bridge that can be elevated is to accommodate boat traffic. Um, one of the reasons why the 59th Street Bridge is as high as it is, is because it has to accommodate the boat traffic. And um, when there are certain events and things going on in the city, uh, for example, um, when there's activity at the UN or on the Upper East Side, they will close boat traffic in the major part of the East River between Roosevelt Island and Manhattan, and then have it go down that small corridor that I was talking about to Queens. And one of the issues of trying to uh, design a bridge that could go from Queens, Roosevelt Island into Manhattan are those uh, boat traffic issues? Yeah, that's understood. And, and this wasn't necessarily touched upon. And again, not to um, be repetitive, but we were only talking conceptually about the idea of a bridge. And this is why it would require a detailed planning study that would have to include discussion of potential impacts and disruptions to um, marine traffic or the ability for events to take place and things of that nature. So it, essentially we're not there yet in terms of being having the answers. It was more just looking at building out the transportation network and providing the additional bike and pedestrian linkages as our starting point. And these matters would be um, further fleshed out. That being said, I do wanna just emphasize that. So for those of you who don't know, Sam Schwartz is, um, also known as Gridlock Sam. He's a former traffic um, commissioner for New York City DOT. And he now runs a, um, his own transportation consulting firm. And he embarked on this project along with a, um, another engineering firm that specializes in bridge construction. So although I can't definitively say that they looked into these issues, I'm sure I have to imagine that if you're talking about a, a, an engineering firm that he essentially described as the premier bridge design firm, that they are aware of these issues, I would at least hope so. Um, yeah, I'm sure that's right, Greg. And they one of the other things that came up as a proposal, so I just want to mention it really quickly, was an additional tramway like the existing tramway that would go from Queens to Roosevelt Island and then into Manhattan. So I just wanted it that that was something else that was discussed during these different points about, because I have to tell you, I'm 100% uh, with creating another way to get into Manhattan from Roosevelt Island. I'm always on page with that. But just those were, that was another way that it was discussed to have something that would facilitate um, some greater foot traffic than the current tramway. So just to, to throw that down too. Okay. Uh, next I think is uh, Rohit, uh, our new board member. Yes. Good evening, everybody. Um, thank you. It's uh, uh, great to be part of uh, the community board. So I'm very happy to be here and thanks for all of the warm welcomes. Um, I, I've been a long time fan of much of what Sam Schwartz proposes, but I am troubled by two things in this. Um, one is the assumption that there is no way to accommodate a growth in cycling traffic by using the Queensboro Bridge. Um, it seems to me that 
there should still be an opportunity if we're talking about 100 or 150 million dollars, which is not expensive for a bridge, as Sam points out, uh, but is far more expensive than, say, expanding bike lanes and taking away another vehicle lane on the 59th Street Bridge. So I'd be more comfortable with this re resolution if it actually called also for a comparison with that alternative. Um, and I guess my other concern, uh, similar to, uh, well, or, or building on what Lynn just said, is that uh, I'd worry very much that the phrasing around Roosevelt Island access is not strong enough here. Um, you know, it's traditional in planning studies that the most difficult thing is included at the beginning and is always cut at the end. And the Roosevelt Island to Manhattan access, if that is the, the thing that CV8 is most enthusiastic about with a new bridge, which I would agree with. If you can get that Roosevelt Island to Manhattan connection that 59th Street definitely will not uh, enable, that would be worth constructing a new bridge. But I think somehow we should be on record that if that isn't incorporated, it's far less valuable. And at least personally, I would much rather see just another traffic lane taken out and more bikes on 59th Street if we don't get the additional um, additional uh, connection to, to Roosevelt Island. Um, I, I offer those as observations. If there's a friendly amendment that you'd be open to, we could discuss that, but I, those are my comments. So can I, listen, if I, if I can suggest first, a lot of this stuff will be, this is the concept we're talking about. A lot of this stuff will be looked at during the study process and the environmental review process, but we could, we could make the resolution stronger by adding the word uh, such studies must include providing direct uh, connectivity from the bridge deck uh, in Ro to Roosevelt Island. So we could add the word must in there, which would make it, which would obviously put a more emphasis on it that we, that we're, right. we're calling for it strongly. That, that would, that would address at least part of my concern. Thank you. Thanks. And I'll just say in terms of, um, the bike traffic levels, um, he emphasized that the issue is just in terms of if you're going to allow bikes to um, to traverse bridges at the numbers that are expected um, based on existing growth rates, that it would be hard to accommodate that on the existing infrastructure. Um, yes, there is the possibility in theory of taking a lane, but if, if you're not aware, we're already going to see the conversion of the South Outer Roadway. Um, so now you have both outer roadways on the Queensboro Bridge that are gonna be dedicated to either bikes or pedestrians. And once that goes, then you're dealing with um, existing, cutting into the, um, into the existing road decks and where the road traffic is. And that from an engineering standpoint would probably be much more complex, especially on a bridge as old as the Queensboro Bridge from 1909. Um, so it, it, and then trying to deal, do it in a way where, you know, the lanes are already extremely narrow as it is on the bridge. So if you try to um, provide that additional infrastructure, even if you take away a lane, and that would be a controversial discussion um, to start with, it probably, is m more complicated to do than building a bridge that would be relatively inexpensive comparatively and provide a new linkage um, and um, other benefits. Okay, um, Sherry Wiener, I think is thinking we had mute Sherry. Yeah, I'm trying to get my head around where this is. Is this just in Mr. Schwartz's head? Has anybody else picked up on this? If CB8 passes a resolution, are we the only ones who are doing so? Um, it sounds like in, from everything is, is a concept, but I mean, I'm not, what role are we gonna, I mean, you know, like are we gonna be the vanguard group that pushing for this? Is anybody else on the bandwagon? Uh, I'm concerned about, you know, what ha has other alternatives been? This, I'm just trying, I, you know, and why is it coming up now, I guess, so 
the all lead to where you know where is this in in the real world personally i wish that we were the the, the pioneers, but CB6 already passed the resolution. I believe it was unanimous there also in support of the, of the concept. Um, and I think they did that um, late last year. So we are still months behind them. So we, where does it go from here, Craig? If we pass it, who, who do we, this goes to city council or where, who, where, who do we have to convince to, to, to do this? We, we need the, the city um, to essentially perform the planning study to do the um, to do the um, whole effort in terms of looking at traffic impacts and looking at the feasibility of actually doing it. We have to take it from the concept, which is let's build a bridge from some undefined points in Long Island City to some undefined points in Manhattan and figure out, A, can you actually do it given the constraints? B, if so, where would the bridge land on either side? C, to, um, to the point made earlier, how high would you have to do it? And, and in order to not disrupt marine traffic, can you actually build it in a way where people would be able to access it? And then all the other factors in place as well to make sure that it's, it's possible. Um, so, so we're, this, so this, we're, we're so really just, comes, ask, just promoting, saying we support the concept of this. We like the idea of it. We understand that we're nowhere near ready to support a specific project because there isn't a project on paper, but we want the city to move ahead with the planning efforts in order to um, take us to the next step. So you're really looking for funding from the city to pay for this, the planning studies. It sounds like you want this to be a budget, a, you know, a budget item to, to provide the funding oh, for this. The city to undertake the study at itself. That's what, that's the whole idea. The city has to support it. If the city doesn't support it, it doesn't go anywhere. Okay. okay. All right, Sharon, Sharon Pope Marshall from Roosevelt Island. Can we unmute Sharon? Uh, I am um, a big, can you hear me? Yes. Yeah. yeah. I'm a big fan of Sam Schwartz. I, I think he's just absolutely phenomenal. I appreciate his uh, commitment to New York City. And uh, he has often uh, pushed the envelope, which really forces us uh, to, to think outside of the box. In this situation, however, I don't think that he has been daring enough and bold enough in his um, idea. And I would like to uh, echo Lynn's remarks about uh, the, the possibility of looking at uh, building a tram. Um, and the reason is because I, I, I a, a tram is just so much easier. When I walk the streets of New York City, no matter where I am, I'm always thinking about where could a tram be? <laughs> you know, where where could we have, I, I, I really envision a tram from lower Manhattan, you know, to 125th Street and, and beyond. And that's what I think that Sam ought to be doing. Um, it's, it's cheaper, it's less expensive, it's quiet, um, and uh, it's, it's relatively easy to put up. So, you know what, um, you know, I'm still not sure that I will uh, support this. Um, you know, I, I'm, I'm still uh, thinking about it, but I, I don't believe that he has been um, bold enough uh, to think outside of the box on, on this one. And also I'd like to um, uh, echo Lynn's comments as well in, in terms of uh, wa welcoming uh, Paul Kirkler as a public member to the Roosevelt Island Community uh, Committee. Thank you. Thank you. Um, Michelle, who's at our committee meeting, Michelle. Yeah, thank you. Um, I don't usually, support concepts. Um, this was purely and only a concept. And when I started to think of the decisions that have to be made along the way, 
I would have a lot of reservations about this. For example, somebody at the committee said, well, it could it could go it could on the Manhattan side, it could end up near the United Nations. Now, to me, that would be the worst place in the world for it to be because of security reasons and all the reasons you can imagine. But the reason I didn't take that into consideration at the transportation meeting for this vote is because the idea was that we that we wouldn't take any of those specifics into consideration um, for this vote that that would come much later on. The where would it be? Where would it land? Where would it start? How all of those decisions that would come up with the design committee with um, all, of the, you know, I think it needs a, um, a ULERP, it needs everything. So to my mind, if you start to get more specific with this resolution, even to the point of saying that it has to include a stop in Roosevelt Island, that for me is too advanced planning for this concept. And then I, I would not vote for the resolution. If you can keep it purely conceptual and in the resolution, just verify that we understand that we will be dealing with every conceivable detail, funding, planning, design, everything down the road. And when we will have a lot of opportunity to accept or reject I can go with that because it was a very, he had very attractive drawings and conceptually it seemed like a good idea. But if you add any friendly, resolu uh, friendly amendments that speak to any specifics in this resolution, then I will, I will not vote for it because that's exactly what I don't want to do. I would want to not even make that commitment until I saw it in terms of the entire proposal. Thanks. Michelle, if I can just point out that the language in the resolution now refers to studies, that such studies include providing direct connectivity from the bridge deck to Roosevelt Island. And I, I just said and that such studies must include. That's really... Well, you're using the word study, but the friendly amendment didn't say no, no, study. No, no, no. No, it, no, it so, just had the word studies. The word studies is still in there. It, just, it only had the word must more emphasis that the studies you know must include that and yes I, but not that it must have a stop what i heard was that it must have some connection with roosevelt island that's what yeah. that was the friendly amendment no 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 but it, no. you're fading in and out but that was the friendly amendment if it says that it must have a connection to roosevelt island if you are incorporating michelle Listen to me, please. I, maybe the connections aren't as good. I'm maybe. sorry. I, I, I just realized I was muted. Um, you, no, you, what I'm saying is the amendment said that it must have a connection to, to Roosevelt Island. I if should, you're saying the study, that you're not going to have... Michelle, it's that the study must include looking at that question. So no sure. one is talking about what the connection is going to have. It's a question of what the study has to include. Right. Michelle, let me just read you the original resolution that's uh, the original resolution here says um, not the whole thing but and that such studies include providing direct connect connectivity from the bridge deck to Roosevelt Island that's in the resolution now that's the original wording I just suggested the word such studies must that's all I added include providing direct connectivity that, so I just, I didn't add any other things. So that, that friendly amendment doesn't change the original resolution except for adding the word must about the studies. That's it. So that's just to be clear. Well, now, uh, yes, I want to be very clear. If, it, if the must refers to the study, that's one thing. If the must is, uh, refers to the connectivity, that's another thing. It's a yeah. study. It's, it's a, a study. study. He just read it. So it's, it's okay. 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 Thank you. Okay, Rita Popper. All the question on the concept of this bicycle footbridge from Queens to New York. Seconded by Rebecca. That's what the resolution says. Just so we're all clear, the resolution is about a concept and the only change was that the study must include the connectivity. 
Roosevelt Island. That's it. So we don't have to have people asking what it is. Okay. Can we have Great. the- Great. Calling the question is Rebecca. Yeah, go ahead, Rebecca. Uh, if you would like to vote no, abstain or not vote for cause, please raise your hand. Alita. I'm sorry, maybe this is a point of information. Does the resolution include um, not just bikes, but pedestrians as well? Yes. The resolution. Because Chuck just said bicycles. No, well, there's a- The bridge would have both. The answer is that the bridge would have both. The bridge has both. Good, thank you. Okay. Then, exactly. then I vote yes. Okay. Okay. Uh, Elaine Walsh, I see you. Uh, Voting no. Okay. Got it. Uh, Barbara Chalky? No. All right, I'll give everyone another few seconds. Remember, if you'd like to vote no, abstain or not vote for cause, please raise your hand. Uh, seeing none, uh, the motion passes. Okay. The Thanks. resolution passes, sorry. Right. Chuck, can we interrupt you really quickly? Councilmember Kalos is here and he only has five minutes. Um, would course. you be okay with? Yeah, of course. Thank you yes, very much. Over to uh, Council Member. Go ahead. Thank you very much for having me. I try to never miss uh, a CBA meeting. I think the only elected official who may rival my attendance is Manhattan Pro President Gail Brewer. Uh, she has particularly good attendance. I want to thank uh, Chair Russell Squire. I want to welcome new members to the board. Uh, in particular, I'd like to uh, welcome uh, Ima Rodriguez uh, Toma. We met her, Gail Brewer and I, uh, with through Community Voices Heard, uh, organizing at Normandy Court. And we're incredibly welcome to have a, uh, another tenant and tenant activist. And look forward to working with her to continue uh, organizing tenants at Normandy Court and to have another strong voice on the board. I want to thank everyone on this board for months and months and months of uh, hearing from the community on the flood center. Looking forward to a strong resolution on that and not getting that until exactly June 28th, not a day before, not a day after. It's been um, passed, it won't be submitted until then. <laughs> Uh, and then just a reminder to everyone, our borough president has committed to having a hearing on it. So I'm asking folks to come out for that. And I'm still completely and utterly disappointed in the fact that they literally reflected zero community feedback whatsoever and joined rallies uh, with hundreds of members of communities. I think we're now up to, uh, if not nearly a thousand, over a thousand people who have weighed in almost unanimously opposed uh, Another piece is just as we seek to recover, if you live on the east side, you know that there are illegal short-term rentals all over the place. We've introduced legislation that would require the hosts and the hosting platforms to register uh, so that people aren't well, violating their lease terms without knowing it, particularly rent-controlled, rent-regulated, or even building owners where it's actually illegal in many cases. As we deal with a lot of the hate uh, whether it's directed at the API community or even the Jewish community on the Upper East Side, of which I'm a part, uh, we're standing in solidarity and thank this community board for the great work you're doing. Uh, something we've been working on since before I got elected, I'm actually an ERISA attorney, is retirement security for all legislation written by now Attorney General Tish James, signed into law, and it's going to guarantee every New Yorker can retire, uh, every employer with five or more employees, uh, where an employee works 21 is over 21 and works more than 20 hours a week, uh, will be auto-enrolled in a uh, retirement program if no one is not already offered. And uh, at a rate of about 5%, it's gonna help a lot of New Yorkers save for retirement. Uh, I wanna just share that we uh, have sent a letter from my office uh, in support of the Roosevelt Island subway station to have an additional access point. Uh, for better or for worse, uh, folks have been able to make Roosevelt Island an incredible destination, uh, whether it's because it was called the Rose Belt Island, and I recommend that you Google it, or because of the amazing Cherry Blossom Festival, having an extra entrance uh, would allow for people to come in and go at the same time instead of being crammed into four doors. Um, we've also held our annual town hall on uh, tenants' rights. 
Uh, if you know somebody who is uh, struggling to pay rent, we have the Emergency Rental Assistance Program secured by our Congresswoman Carol Maloney. You can learn more about ERAP at uh, facebook.com slash Ben Kalos slash videos. Pandora says hi. She's in the background trying to distract me. Uh, we are moving forward. We have another information session on your opportunity to own a co-op in the neighborhood at 1402 York Avenue. Uh, so please reach out to my office if you have any questions about how to apply. Uh, and uh, I just want to take a moment. One of the reasons, uh, oh, uh, on, on Tuesday, there's this new thing called ranked choice voting. There's a presentation you can watch at facebook.com for us or on Keith Powers' side. I know Gail Brewer has been running around trying to tell everyone about ranked choice voting. Uh, polls are open on through Sunday as well as on Tuesday from 6 a.m. to 9 p.m. And the, the real reason I am here is because, as you may have heard, uh, we are uh, Abby Damsky uh, from my office, uh, just will not listen to me or reason. Uh, I'm a lawyer and I've tried to talk, anyone has told me they wanna be a lawyer out of it. And I'm sure Russell and many others on this board would agree the worst thing we, the last thing we need is more lawyers. Uh, but that being said, uh, Abby's chosen to go to law school and we're incredibly happy for her. She's worked with me uh, for three years. She does not look like she has aged a day. Uh, and she has been committed, dedicated, and she's really gone out of her way. She's been leading our East Side Task Force for Homeless Outreach and Services. And uh, whether it's the uh, housing for homeless women and children that we opened, or this near unanimous resolution from Kenny Board 8 to open a safe haven in the neighborhood, she's been really hard at work. She's also been our point on the blood center. So I just want to thank Abby for her great work and uh, let her know that there will always be a, a spot in our office, wherever we are for her, whether as an attorney or something else. And it seems like she's getting a thumbs up and even Pandora says goodbye. But if you can join me in saying uh, thank you for your service and uh, that's it. Thank you for letting me jump in. And I see we have our borough president here too. I can wait, I can wait. Thank you very much. Um, council member. Russell, go ahead. I can wait. I'm fine. Okay, thanks. Yeah, and thank you very much, uh, Council Member Kalis. All right, so let's proceed with the rest of the Transportation Committee. So item three is uh, the fairway market at 86th Street uh, between 2nd and 3rd. And um, as many of you know, this goes back a ways. When fairway first came in and it was a family-owned the business, we get, the board gave them a uh, big truck loading zone that covered uh, a large part of the street in front of their premises. And, and uh, it was supposed to be used mostly by them, but also by other stores in the, in the area. And over the years, there have been, there were many complaints of um, the fact that uh, there were trucks, their trucks double parked, things were all over the sidewalk. Uh, there were pallets and everything there. And, um, we had a lot of trouble getting them to respond. And um, we asked them to come to several meetings and they didn't. And the last meeting when we asked them to come, uh, they, the, the store manager sent back that he's too busy. He can't, he can't make it. So to, we responded as a committee and as a board by reducing the hours of their truck loading zone, which were 5 a.m. to midnight to uh, 7 a.m. to 9 p.m. That seemed to, that got their attention and it just so happened that um, there was a new company that took over last year and they, they, they blamed it on the fact that there was still the old store manager who was there. And at our meeting, at our meeting in May, um, the general counsel of the, of the new company plus the New York operations head came and they made a number of promises about what they would do and reducing all of the stuff on the sidewalk and you know, rearranging deliveries and, and a whole bunch of things that they committed to. And we said, okay, let's see what happens. We want you to come back next month, which was this month of June. And um, we'll, see what, we'll see how things look. And just as an aside, we had passed the resolution in May from the committee and the board. And literally after our board meeting, 
the Department of Transportation came and changed the signs in a, an amazing display of efficiency, which almost never happens when you're talking about signs like this. So they came, they came back to us in June. And in the interim, a number of us who go by there um, basically had seen how much better things were. They really worked very hard to uh, clean up the sidewalk. They rearranged a whole bunch of things and they came back and they testified as to everything that they did. And there's a whole list in our minutes of the things that they did and they're still working on other things. So they, they asked us to, um, to go back. Could we go back and essentially put the, put the signs back to the way they had been before we asked for them to be changed? And um, we, the committee agreed to do that. And they agreed to come back again next month and report on some of the changes and, and, be, and be available to come back to us to report on a periodic basis. And, um, so, and, and we always have, and, and we talk to the Department of Transportation and if we don't think things are working well, we can always go back and have the signs put up again. That's not a big issue to do. So that's really what happened. So we passed the unanimous resolution um, uh, to change things back to the way they had been before we got them changed. Um, and I see Rita, Rita Popper, I see, has her hand up. Can we unmute Rita? Chuck, um, I have no dispute with the loading zone, the not loading zone. My dispute with them is the use of the sidewalk as a merchandising space for them. I went around the entire community, uh, Morton, Williams, Key Food, Sea uh, Town. Nobody is merchandising, leaving stuff on the sidewalk. It's a large sidewalk. They have told us they can't bring in the pallets that except Brett, those are piled, I'm only barely five feet, uh, and it's taller than I am. And when I asked them, he said, no, no, they can't bring those in because they get fresh bread daily. Well, so do the other places. The point is, is that they rented the space and in order to capitalize on every inch of their indoor space, they had to move outdoors. It's the storage outdoors. It's not food outdoors. Uh, it also is how quickly you remove deliveries from the street to where they go indoors. They are the only supermarket in our community that uses the sidewalk as a, as part of their, their building. And I, I don't think that's right. I really don't, but I don't want to lose airway, but it, I don't know, did they, did, is sidewalk use in their contract? No, Rita, I think that was one of the major issues that we raised with them. And one of the, and that's what they've made improvements now, the number of forklifts uh, in use has been reduced from four to one. And they have a counterbalancing machine, which is a device that could eliminate the last forklift, was delivered earlier this month and is being tested. So there shouldn't be any forklifts. Instead, the, the delivery of one of their major distributors that's responsible for about one third of all deliveries has been shifted to a five to 9 p.m. window when no other deliveries were taking place. That's so they can get things off the street quickly, just because of what you were talking about. Shopping carts have been removed from the outside of the store and a new gatekeeper system that would lock carts and thus prevent them from leaving the indoor area has been ordered and is expected to be delivered mid to late June. And, it, and the number of storage uh, bail has been both reduced from six to two positions. And more storage now available in the basement rather than on the street. Okay. 
new receiving staff has been hired to cover right, AM to 2 PM timeframe when two thirds of all product is delivered. And so what they're doing is they're trying to, the time to unload product from delivery trucks has been significantly reduced. And we have their commitment to keep, keep the sidewalk uh, clear and not let that stuff be piled up on the sidewalk and stay there. And, and that's what they're doing. And Michelle has been especially on our committee has been especially vigilant and um, we're coming back. They're coming back next month to report on what they've done. And, you know, we're gonna, obviously a number of us live in the neighborhood and uh, we'll see how things are progressing. But, uh, but I think, you know, when I was there, I, <coughs> I've noticed, you know, a much bigger improvement of things not piled up in, in the same way that they had been before, the, the way you were discussing. So I think, there's, I think there is a big improvement and I think we've got their attention at the highest levels, particularly the guy who's the head of the New York operations, who seems very conscientious and wants to, they, they wanna be a good neighbor. You know, they're a new company, Village Supermarkets that took over about a year ago to own the stores here. So, so that's why we decided, listen, let's give them a shot here. The, it's not products that are on the, on the sidewalk. It is pallets. No, that's, it, the, that's what they're trying it, to get rid of. That's exactly what they're trying to get rid of. And they've gotten rid of a lot of that. Okay, well, they have it yet. Okay. I just want you to know, thank you. I, I also think there are times of day where it's inevitable that they'll be out for a little while. I, I just want to reiterate what Chuck was saying. I walk by virtually every day now that I'm back commuting to work and walking to the 86th Street station at Lexington every day. I would just be up in arms over the condition of it and would frequently take photographs. So I had the evidence and I walk by right now and barely notice it. And when I do notice it, I'm like, oh, wow, it really is much um, much more open right now where there's very little activity taking place both in the morning and in the evening when I walk by. So I, I think they even would admit it's never going to be perfect. I, they're still dealing with a constrained situation and there's always going to be some time to unload and get things in. But I think there's definitely been a major improvement in the efficiencies that they've been implementing hopefully are sustainable. You know, why don't we take it? I see the number of people who want to be coming. Elaine, Elaine Walsh, why don't we uh, uh, unmute Elaine? Well, I'm going to speak also as president of the East 86th Street Association, which was the only association that opposed Fairway coming in because of their reputation. And because we had connections, we were able to not allow them to sell and put out vegetables on the street. As far as the loading areas, that was to be shared. And I remember Margaret Porgioni saying to me, I can't believe CB8 has given them the hours they gave. One, Fairway has never, ever shared that space with any other merchant including when we had the secondary new construction. My concern and our complaints from people are the beep, 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 late at night, people can't sleep. The landlord for that building will never again rent to such an establishment. While sometimes there might be a cleaner, clearer sidewalk, we still have the pallets they have a curb cut that no other grocery store has. And I cannot believe that that was approved by this board. I have gone by there, right? The grocery carts, which are a violation of the Department of Consumer Affairs regulations, finally have moved off a little bit. But mm -hmm. guess what? You go inside, there are no more grocery carts to use, okay? So where did they go? But the double parking, the traffic, the filth, their delivery people tying up to the tree guards all of their little carts 
is an obstruction. You still can't, get, there might be days you could get down or hours, but it has not changed. They have not responded to the community. The filth, the garbage, and the loitering is unacceptable. I'm sorry to in any way change the parking regulations again is despicable because they don't share it with anybody else. And we have neighbors from all of the buildings calling, complaining about the beep, 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 beep all night long, okay? So they're not respecting the neighborhood. The fact that they finally came to the committee after how many months, because their hours got changed was a self-interest. We have not seen, nor and, and I grew up on that street and I am furious with this group, which is now a family owned from New Jersey, operating a free for all. You don't see it with any of the other grocery stores. You don't see it with anybody else, but they think they have a right and I will oppose any change now back. By the way, they're parking after nine o'clock at night. I have to tell you, I know that. So unless we have enforcement from the police and traffic and sanitation, we're going to live with the garbage that Fairway produces. They don't have a loading dock. They knew it when they went in and they leased the space. But they have created for the residents of our neighborhood a hellhole. And I know there's a board member here who yelled at me for permitting Fairway to come. And I said, East 86th Street always opposed them. The board supported them. I will not go back on your hours or anything else because I've not seen the change. Thank you. Thank you, Elaine. And I can only say that um, either they came and they said they were going to be trying to do stuff. And as far as those of us who've gone over, they have done stuff and they promised they're going to be doing more. And that's one of those things where I guess we just have to disagree. And I think the committee felt to give them a chance and they re they've responded. They're a, new, they're a new owner. They've only been owning it for about a year. And uh, if things don't go well, we can change it back. But I, that, was the, that was the committee's view unanimously. Um, Sharon, I, I think is next. Uh, Sharon Pope Marshall. Uh, uh, thank you, Chuck. Um, I, I just have a couple of questions. Um, how long were the new signs in place? The, the new reduced signs? About a couple uh, months or so. About the, a what? The signs went up literally the day after our May committee meeting. We passed the resolution in February. DOT ordered the signs and said they would be installed by July 31st. And much to our surprise, it literally went up um, the day after um, our May meeting, which was, I think, May 6th. Or something like that, something around the 5th. Okay, and uh, just for clarification, uh, the new owners, are they, so so does that mean that Fairway is no longer family owned? I'm, I'm not sure. No, it is. It's now a group that uh, I think is Elaine mentioned they're from New Jersey and they, and they, what they did was, you know, Fairway started out family owned. It was picked up by a larger group. They went into sort of almost an insolvency and they, because they opened too many stores all, you know, all over the place. They've cut, now they bought it and they have fewer stores and um, this is one of them. And, uh, but it's a smaller operation and they seem to be, they want to be very responsive. You know, they sent the general counsel and the head of New York operations to our meeting in May and June, and they committed to come back and report in July also. So, um, Chuck, I remember the vote on Fairway. And um, so that that's saying something. 
in terms of our uh, tenure on the board. And uh, I've, I've heard for years and years and years about the conditions on the sidewalk. And uh, I, I have not heard any good news about Fairway until this evening. I'm, I'm so glad that uh, there has been some improvement. Um, I, I think that it's uh, really very, very necessary. I'm on that block uh, quite often, in fact, more often uh, since the uh, Second Avenue subway was put in. And, uh, and also I love Fairway uh, overall. And I do think that it's a community amenity, but I also think that those signs should stay up a little bit longer. I, I find it uh, very interesting that uh, the, that uh, the owner that the new owners were in, and I correct me if I'm wrong, that the new owners owned Fairway for approximately a year. Is that correct? Yes. Yeah. Okay. Okay. I cannot believe that they did not hear that the community was unhappy with the degree to which the sidewalk was being used. And they, they only responded after the new signage. That's very troubling to me. Um, and I, you know what, I'm, I'm thinking that signage ought to stay up there a little bit longer, but I will go ahead and support the committee resolution. It was a unanimous uh, re resolution overall, but I, I want you, to, I, I do want to go on record to, to say that I'm uh, troubled because they were in place, the ownership, the new ownership was in place but they only responded after the change in signage. Thank you. Sharon, just to say, to say one more thing about that. We, when the, you know, what they said was they, they bought it like May, you know, a year ago, May, but what they, there was a lot of reorganization and the question of how many stores would be open and they really didn't get into the management of the, of the stores until relatively recently. And that, and you know, obviously they saw our thing and they responded immediately. They said they hadn't been aware of that. So you can believe it or not, but that's, you know, that's what, but, but they have moved with alacrity on this. And, and we said, we're prepared to put the signs back because I said DOT told us they could put them back and I'll be the first one to say they ought to go back if it looks like they're not doing what needs to be done and following through on their commitments. Um, Sherry Wiener, can I mute Sherry? I frankly think it's unconscionable that you're allowing a commercial establishment to disturb the neighbors from, you're saying from five o'clock in the morning till 12 o'clock at night. I mean, I, you haven't mentioned the disruption. I'm forgetting about the sidewalk. I'm just talking about the noise. There has to be noise connected with deliveries and yes, and the backups. Why do they need so many hours? You're giving them seven in the morning till nine at night. I just don't understand why that, why the, the quality of life issue to the neighbors is not a priority. Uh, for your committee, I, I, I will be voting against this. I, I don't think it's necessary. They should be able, no matter what they do, they should be able to get their deliveries and you're giving them, let's see, five, you're giving them 14 hours to do deliveries. I'm sorry, they should be able to work within those concerns. I would urge people to vote against this, just thinking about the neighbors, forgetting about the other things that are raised. It's just, it's just noise. And why should people have to put up with this? Thank you. What they said on that, Sherry, was that uh, a lot of the deliveries take place between 5 a.m. and 2 p.m. And they're smaller trucks and they've arranged for the bigger trucks to come, you know, at the, around, you know, in, in the 5 p.m. to 9 p.m. And there's, there's, there's very little done, but there's important stuff that comes later that 
but that's smaller stuff. And they said that basically they they don't think that's a major contributor to noise and stuff because it's not the big stuff is done by 9 p.m. So, um, you know, that, look, they're there. They're a store that a lot of people like. And the question is, obviously, we'd, we'd like to see them operate, but we want to protect the neighborhood too. And we think uh, with the new things that they've talked about, uh, they can do that. If, if it turns out that they can't and we still get complaints and we haven't really, we haven't really heard as many complaints lately, you know, since they've started to uh, make those changes. I don't know if Will has, I, I mean, I haven't heard anything. And as uh, Craig said, he goes by there every day and it looks a lot better. And so I think, look, they're working hard and they said they were gonna do stuff and they've done it. And we're gonna be following them very closely. Um, okay, let's see, Peggy Price, who I know is on 86 Street. Yeah, hi, thanks so much, Chuck, for visiting this rather horrendous situation. I live there and I'm very sad to say that I'm seeing not that much improvement. Boxes still cluttering the sidewalk, making it difficult for me and I'm perfectly ambulatory to get around the boxes. I have, I typically do not even walk on that side of the street, even now when they said that they've improved it, the situation because I find it dangerous. And I really hope my fellow board members will not vote it for a situation that could restore the problems that we've had for such a long time that have not adequately been addressed. Now you may disagree with that, but I live there and it really is not acceptably cleaned up at all. And, um, and I don't know anybody in my building or in the neighborhood that finds this remotely acceptable. I'd be happy if we could further tighten the parking regulations, regulations rather than loosening them. Uh, it's not an acceptable situation for the community. But I want to thank you for addressing this, and I hope you'll really keep a, an eye on them because and it's not it's not working. Thanks, Chuck. Okay, thank you, Peggy. Um, Michelle, can we unmute Michelle? Yeah, thanks, Chuck. Look, I agree with absolutely everything everybody said. Elaine and I met with Fairway when they signed the lease <clears throat> when Micah Kellner was in office. And we were very opposed to them coming in. We fought every step of the way at the board because we understood what their reputation was on the West side. And it was as a result of that fighting that they never got the permit to put the food on the street, which they have in the West side. Now, one of their big issues was that they had four forklifts. And what they did is those forklifts were lining their parking, a hundred foot parking. And therefore the deliveries were now in the line of traffic. And then a secondary delivery would be even further in traffic. They made a big concession by eliminating three of the four forklifts. Uh, the pallets are still out there. They made a big um, decision when they got this indoor uh, wagon corral, which actually will have a sensor on it, which will not allow it to leave the interior of the store so it can't come out. They are reconfiguring uh, part of the interior to make unloading into their basement area of their inventory more efficient and they have increased the staff to do that. Now, am I an advocate for what's happening on that sidewalk? No, however, they are here. And if we can't have a carrot and a stick with them, then we have nothing with them. In other words, if they're there, they have a lease. We know that the police are not coming there on a daily basis or sanitation to monitor them and do enforcement and give them tickets. We are the watchdogs. And in order to be a watchdog, we have to be have something to give them and something to take away. It, they did about six of the things that we asked them. And now if we don't give them anything, 
they're going to say, what are we knocking ourselves out for going before the community board? We have a lease. We're staying here. Nobody's going to enforce what we're doing. We're here. So we're a little bit between a rock and a hard place. But if you're really trying to work with them, um, then this is how to do it. Now, originally, they were supposed to come back after the summer. And I have to say that the co-chairs agreed. I really pushed, pushed, pushed. I said, oh, no, they have to come back in July. And for my mind, they have to come back every month. Um, and the DOT assured us that, the, that these signs can be, you know, this restrictive signs can be put back should they start to falter. So we don't have much leverage over them. We can vote them down all we want. They have a lease. They're going to do business there. And people in the community, while they don't like the quality of life issues that they present to us, they like shopping there. And that's why they want to be there. If that wasn't a popular destination and a successful store, they'd be out in a minute. And I don't think we're looking for another empty store in our neighborhood. So I absolutely agree with every comment everybody's made. I have often said I have more pictures of fairways and street vendors than I have of my grandchildren. I have documented every move they've made over the years. I sympathize, I understand, but we don't really have that much leverage. So if they're playing ball with us and we are gonna follow this very carefully, let's give them the reward that became the bargaining chip here. We will ask them to come back monthly and actually in advance, they agreed that they would and that they would always be uh, accessible to us. And let's follow along. And if things revert or don't improve further, then we have recourse to reinstate the sign. But to just say we don't like them and we don't want them and they're annoying and it's dirty, I firmly agree, but they're there and they have a lease. Now, let me address that noise thing, those beep, beep, beep. I can tell you surrounded by construction that drives me mad. One of the things I asked of them when they move their large truck delivery till about five o'clock uh, into the later parts of the day and early evening, I said, please be mindful of noise. I said, and, and noise really even consists of their workmen talking, you know, like somebody yelling out to so-and-so, you know, like, hey, Bob, I'm tossing you this, that they have to really be very mindful. They are in the bottom of an apartment house. I mean, they're actually in the building. Um, that backwards beep, beep, beep with the construction that's all around us is something that drives me mad. I know it's a safety uh, feature on all of these little trucks and forklifts or whatever. What we can do to mitigate that, I'm not sure because it's almost a requirement to have it. Maybe that's something we can talk to the DOT about because that noise is particularly disturbing in many, many, many parts of the city. So I would love to address that. But for the, for the thing at hand tonight, I think you have to say thank you for the little bit that you did. Thank you for at least listening to us. Please come back. We're monitoring you very, very closely. And we stand on the record that if you don't heal here, you know, what you're doing, if you don't continue to improve, we're having those signs put back up. So I don't think we have much of a recourse. So I ask you to support this resolution. Thank you, Michelle. Um, and I should, I should just point out that I was the one that suggested to the committee that we change these back in May. So because of the fact that they weren't paying any attention to us. And now for the reasons that Michelle has stated, they are. And so that's why we've done what we've done. Um, uh, Remy, can we unmute? Uh, Remy? Yeah, I think your committee's done an amazing job on this issue. Uh, I'd like to call the question. Okay, is there a second to that? Second. Second, Russell, seconds, okay. And Rebecca, there's a few seconds. So can we have one of the secretaries call the roll? Okay, I'll do that. Um, please raise your hand if you are voting no, abstaining, or not voting for cause. Okay. Um, I'm going to go back and forth to our spreadsheet here, so bear with me as I call the names. We'll start with Elaine Walsh. No. Thank you. Barbara Chalky. 
No. Thank you. Anthony Cohn? No. Thanks, Anthony. Sherry Wiener? No. Thank you. Uh, Peggy Price? No. Thank you, Peggy. Um, next up, Mrs. Brown. Uh, it's an ADA compliance issue for me. Um, being in a motorized chair or on a walker, I would have to say no. Thank you, Mrs. Brown. Abraham Salcedo? No. Thank you. Next is Marco Tamayo. I'm a customer, I'm gonna say no. Thank you, Marco. Um, okay, seeing no other nope. hand. Oh, more. We have a few more hands, okay. Gail Barron. No. Thank you, Gail. Uh, Valerie Mason. No. Thank you. Um, do we have anyone on the phone who might need a, instructions on raising their hand? Wilma, Wilma uh, has her hand up. Johnson has her hand up, yeah. No. No. Thank you. Um, anyone else? Okay, I'll go count the votes. It appears the resolution passes. Thanks, everyone. And we will be keeping a close eye on that uh, on, on things. And we'll report back to the board and we'll change things if we have to. And they will be back in July if anyone wants to raise any other questions. Right. Russell, I think we're finished. OK, thank you very much. Uh, so just before we go to our next committee, I'll give Gail Brewer, our borough president, a chance to report if she likes or if she wants to just keep uh, listening. That's fine, too. Um, I'll report very quickly, but I'll keep listening. So I do want to thank the new members. We will have a blood center hearing. And I want to thank everyone who's worked so hard on that. Um, we did have, we do every Tuesday at three o'clock, we have discussion about either how the city can recover or vaccines. And I keep saying that you're all welcome to join us. Just uh, let Jessica Mates in our office know. And we'll put her information in the chat, but you know how to reach us. The most recent was Tuesday. And it was mostly on the issue of food and the fact that still food insecurity. And I think some of the topics that you know. Um, Liz, uh, Ackles is from the food, uh, she's been doing food justice work for years. And she said something really clearly that doesn't necessarily impact all of us, but boy, does it um, make a difference for the economy of the city of New York. So the federal government, for those parents whose children were at home during the pandemic, each child, and there's a whole formula and they'll, you know, it's being figured out either on their benefit card or on a check, will get uh, enough funding to cover some of the food that they had to purchase uh, because they're not in school. That's the short version. But what is interesting to you at board eight and why you have to make sure that, you know, even in a resolution, uh, making sure that people do spend that money. Some people may be embarrassed to spend it. They don't need it. They shouldn't get it. Spend it. It is $1.2 billion dollars in the next year for the city of New York. That kind of money circulating in the city is really important to be circulating. So I just wanna bring that up as something, might even be 1.5. Um, so that was a clear uh, message. Make sure that it's called pandemic EBT um, and make sure it gets spent. Um, we've all been working to try to stop uh, the anti-Asian hate that is uh, way too pervasive. So we've been working with the uh, Asian American Federation uh, Joanne Hugh, who is a phenomenal executive director, and we're asking uh, people to make a PSA, either in English or in any other language, uh, by uh, June 21st. Send it to info at manhattanbp.nyc.gov by five o'clock as to ideas that you might have, and there'll be prizes and uh, judging uh, to figure out how to have uh, something like this go through social media. Um, we are Tomorrow morning is the borough board. It's always a uh, hearing. And the issue here, I think you know only too well, is the issue of zoning for accessibility, that text amendment, which has got a lot of discussion. And I know that all the suggestions 
that you and particularly board one made are all part of the resolution. So feel free to join us at 830 or I know that uh, certainly your wonderful chair always does join us and we'll be voting for you. We are continuing Make Music New York and it is in community board number eight. It will be uh, the 21st of June, 5 to 8 p.m. at Carl Shorts Park. You know it too well, 86th Street East End Avenue. And we have at least four phenomenal uh, groups playing music all for free and we will have lots of food. So feel free to join us. Last year, we obviously were not able to do that. Um, we are doing something uh, special on Friday in one Center Street at noon. We are renaming the conference room after Constance Baker Motley. Um, and we will be joined by both C. Virginia Fields, former woman uh, borough president, and Ruth Messinger, former borough president. You're all welcome to join us if you want. It's a small token, but it has to do with sort of our Juneteenth celebration, something that um, is very special to all of us. There's a story behind it, which is that when I, uh, Ruth Bader Ginsburg was at your Y, your 92nd Street Y, many, not maybe, maybe five years ago, and I was at a table near her. And I kind of felt like, do I really go up to say hello to her? Because she's such a big deal. But I got enough courage to do it. And I said, I'm Gail Brewer, Manhattan Borough President. And she looked at me. This is the current Supreme Court Justice, no spring chicken, brilliant, and looks at me and gives me, she doesn't say hello, Gail, she just said Constance Baker Motley, and she gave me the dates when she was borough president. Oh my goodness. So that's how great she was. Anyway, those are some of the issues that we're working on. Thank you very much, Mr. Chair, and congratulations to everyone on board eight. Can you just, uh, sorry, Gail, do you know the answer to, can EBT funds be donated? Yes, they can. Um, absolutely. And people who are obviously not getting them on their benefits card are donating them. I can find for you, I don't know if I have at this moment, there was actually a site uh, that was collecting funds. But yes, you can donate them, of course, to whatever charity you, you would like. The idea is just make sure they get spent because obviously any charity is going to spend them, particularly from the community. Thank you. All right. So let's keep our agenda rolling here. So we're going to go next to the Parks and Waterfront Committee. So I'm going to turn it over to Barry and Tricia. And thank you very much, uh, Gail, for that report. Thank you. And good Hi. evening, all. Tricia, go ahead, please. I'm sorry. No worries. Hi, good evening, everybody. We just have one resolution. Uh, it was unanimous. But before we uh, go to discussion or a vote, I just wanted to give you a little bit of background. 2026 is going to mark the 100th anniversary of bowling lawn activities, croquet included in that on Central Park. We had a group of local activists who are hoping to commemorate that on the historic um, Mineral Springs grounds within Central Park. They gave us a really wonderful presentation of what bowling games used to be in Central Park. And unfortunately, the state of the grounds right now, which are incredibly pop, uh, patchy and uneven mineral springs the building is fairly uninspired comparatively to what was historically there and they asked us for our support in calling for the restoration of the building to a more historical um, you know state um, and as well as the restoration of the grounds uh, and we passed the unanimous resolution I see Michelle Yes, um, I, I heartily, heartily support this. And um, it, it got a unanimous committee vote as well. But I just want to say that th this is a group of people who one, one gentleman spoke in the public session, and they are really struggling and trying to get the word out. And to my upset, um, they reported that the Central Park Conservancy was unresponsive to them. Now, that's their job, is to restore the park and to keep the park in good shape. And this is such a phenomenal amenity where people come from you know, far and wide. It doesn't just support that sport is much more far reaching than just the local community. 
um, as is true with everything in Central Park. People come, tourists come, people come from all everywhere. And so um, it was very discouraging and disappointing to me that the conservancy wasn't more responsive. So I hope that the whole board gives it a good unanimous approval because I can't see any downside to this. Um, restore the grass, restore the building, make it a, a place, a destination where people want to use it, the clubs want to use it, um, and let's put, put a little fire in the seat of the Conservancy as well. So I hope you all support this. Thanks. Thanks, Thanks Michelle. Rita? Well, the question. I see, Mark, has a, I see Marco has a thumbs up seconding. The question has been called and seconded. Would you please call the roll? Okay, I guess I am up. So um, for those who are um, opposed or uh, those who are opposed, uh, abstaining or not voting for cause, if you would uh, raise your hand so we can call on you. Give you another four seconds. Okay, so the motion passes unanimously. Thank you. Thank you all and welcome to the new board members. We welcome you to Community Board 8. Yeah, yeah. thank you. Thank you. Come to our next meeting. <laughs> Thank you, Barry and Tricia. All right, let's go next to the Street Life Committee and Abraham. Okay, hi everyone. Uh, so for Street Life, we have uh, 10 unanimous approvals, SLA approvals, and then we have one item to talk about. Um, would anyone like to make a motion to take the 10 unanimous together? I see hands, so Rita. Well, the question. Great, okay, do I have a second? Barry. Okay, I see thumbs up, great. So we have a second, so uh, let's go ahead and take the roll on the 10 unanimous that are listed and then we will go to item 2A. All right, if you'd like to vote no, abstain or not vote for cause, please raise your hand. <laughs> Seeing none, the resolutions pass unanimously. Great, thank you. Uh, the other matter for conversation was we had a new application uh, from Venki's Food Court, DBA Ohm, on the corner of York Avenue and 80th. Um, and at the meeting, there was a conversation about the outdoor structure that the applicant had constructed. Um, after some back and forth, the applicant agreed to table the conversation and come back this evening to present um, their evidence on their view for the appropriateness of the outdoor structure. So Will, do we have a representative from Venki's Food Corps? If they're here, please raise your hand. Oh, Jesse. Jesse Normand. Oh, yes, Jesse. Jesse Norman, hi. Hi there. Um, do you want to give us uh, an update based from the following from the previous meeting? Sure. Um, I, I reviewed the the previous meeting's minutes um, and went over the concerns of the committee members, um, and uh, we determined uh, that the I guess the the biggest. Um, um, concern was the sidewalk safety or the sidewalk clearance. There is eight feet uh, in between the, the, the structure and the curb. And the curb. Um, there is 96 inches, um, someplace 96 and a half, 96 and a quarter, but there's definitely uh, no area that it's less than. Um, there is a tree that people, um, you know, they had brought up as well. <coughs> Um, and as far as I could tell, um, it, you know, there's no permit on file um, anywhere. Uh, U.S., I mean, the New York City Department of Forestry or, or other places where it may be um, to permit a tree guard 
Um, so there is a small little, I don't know, I guess you would call it very inexpensive uh, wire uh, fencing around the tree um, that shouldn't probably be there. And um, the tree uh, grade or the dirt that's in there could just be brought down the grade. Um, there's two additional rows of uh, uh, Belgian blocks um, on the north and south uh, side or they running parallel with the street um, on each side of the tree as well. Um, so once you clear out that fence, you know, I, I really you have more than four feet on one side and more than, you know, almost three feet on the other, you know, okay. be, be, before, before stepping into the dirt, of course. Sure. You know. um, okay. Thank you for that. Um, so the only thing I want to highlight before I go to some of the other hands of the uh, committees was uh, the, for the purposes of the, of the kind of regulations, you, you're correct that the tree is there, but that doesn't count in terms of the clearance. So if there is eight foot clearance, um, then uh, the tree wouldn't count against that. Uh, the only concern I have is that the only thing that I saw submitted to the board office was a PDF document that highlighted just kind of the regulations and had it highlighted per pertinent uh, sections of the regulations, but nothing that evidenced photos or anything that showed the actual measurement or yeah, kind of um, backed <clears throat> up the clearance. So. We, we, that response that, that your, your question or your request right now was the same request we literally got a couple of, well, it's been hours we've been on this meeting, but I mean, six hours ago, you know, we got that. So our attorney had sent over um, something, uh, basically a request for information for what is it that you guys need from us um, this evening. And, you know, um, we decided just to come to the restaurant, grab a tape measure, you know, um, it was light before, not so much now. Um, sure. But, you know, I have my phone, well, you're on my phone right now. I can show you right now in, in live that it's it's eight feet from the curb right to the structure. Um, the, I, I also, um, um, we Marco. did run into uh, Marco um, and he, um, it, you know, he stopped by and, and, and he just said hi. And, you know, we had measured it then and, and you know, because we were talking about it and, and he did confirm that, you know, that it was eight feet. Um, you know, I, I think that's okay. all I'll say about that. And, and, you know, if you need me to take a tape measure and, and while I'm video right now, I'd be more than happy to do it. I'll do anything that, that you guys, okay. you know, need to do to get this business up and running. Uh, great. So let's let's pause there. And with that, actually, I will the first hand I will take will be Marco. So we'll if we can uh, unmute Marco. Uh, thank you, Ibrahim. At the corner of 81st Street and York Avenue, I pass by every single day. And I saw the owner of the restaurant in question and explained it to the owner that this enclosed sidewalk cafe is illegal. Then the owner said that his contract his contractor would like to talk to me, the person that is just talked. I met him, I handled it to I handed to him the DOT regulations. I told him to review carefully the picture of the DOT rules, which doesn't match with his unlawful structure. Also, this contractor offered to make donations to East 81st Association and explained it that it sounds unlawful, and I told him that I didn't like it yet. In addition, um, that, I explained, no, that, let me finish, let me finish, I spoke already. I explained it that I will oppose this application to set any liquor inside the illegal enclosed sidewalk cafe. Furthermore, the contractor called my attention on the eight feet width requirements. And I saw there is in fact eight feet because a member on the last meeting said that this width doesn't comply with this rule mentioned. Then I said to the contractor that he could call the attention to the a feet, a foot, a feet, full, a feet, feet width at the full board meeting. Also, the tree pit creates a bottleneck pedestrian circulation, leaving a little bit more than three feet wide, reducing drastically the normal pedestrian circulation. Therefore, this enclosed, and that is the issue, 
enclosed sidewalk cafe is impacting negatively the pedestrian circulation on the corner. In addition, while we were talking, a bike delivery came from First Avenue to York against the traffic. Then he went on the bottleneck sidewalk and he picked up a food delivery. I called the owner's attention, but he didn't answer me and left. So I think that the major problem what I described is basically is the contractor, he is blind to see in the regulations of DOT that there is no structure in, 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 the, in the regulations. And that is my point. I think that's okay, like sorry. part five. What was the answer on the eight feet, Marco? It, yes, indeed, a measure eight feet. Okay. I saw that and I said, yes, indeed it is. But I, I also told him that this, the eight feet is not the problem. The problem is the enclosed sidewalk effect. Um, can I speak? Yes, you can go ahead now. All right. <clears throat> I just want to uh, touch on a couple of things that Marco had said. Uh, thank you for clarifying, Marco, that it was eight feet. Um, secondly, um, when uh, I had made the suggestion of a donation to Barbara and the gardening committee uh, for the 81st Street area, it was because I had previously uh, just said that, you know, we would, we, an option that we had, you know, basically tear out the, the flowers, the plantings that are there, bring the, the, the bed of about four inches, three inches down to grade. You know, and we would be more than willing, you know, when this pandemic is, is over and, and we're, we're, you know, getting this off the sidewalk or, or whatever the plans may be, you know, we would be more than happy to contribute to a larger planting or, or something more uh, permanent, you know, for the tree guard or, you know, buying something nice, you know, for, for the two trees that are along the side of the, the restaurant, not as a uh, in a manner that I believed it was spoken about by Marcos, but in a manner of just saying, hey, listen, you know, thank you, you know, for letting us rip out your flowers that you worked on. And we're so sorry, you know, I love gardening. So, you know, I, I would take that right to heart. I'd probably take the flowers and take them home, to be honest with you. Um, but, you know, we would like to make it up to you, you know, for allowing us to do so. And, you know, maybe, you know, help out, you know, in the whatever, in the coming future, you know, with, with replacing it, you know, every time you pick on a tree in New York city, there's a value attached to it. You know, a guy comes and assesses the value of the tree, then, you know, it's, it's gotta be replaced. So that's what that was. <clears throat> Secondly, the, the delivery person that was coming by, yeah, it was a third party delivery person. And you know what, <clears throat> as is in every restaurant, you know, third party delivery people. I mean, it, 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 I, <laughs> unfortunately, you know, we have a city bike rack as well that runs along the, the length of the restaurant. Um, and it, it is a tough corner. Sure, it is, you know, I'll, I'll, I'll admit, you know, but it, we're also in tough times, you know, and, and everybody's trying to get to work and we're just trying to work and I'm just trying to help Sebastian come to the restaurant. Um, and thirdly, um, <clears throat> you know, with the, uh, with the, 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 the DOT regulations that, Marco has been, you know, quoting or, or saying, or, you know, the, look at the graphic, look at the graphic. You know, I, I read the regulations. I've, I'm not blind by them at all. I'm not blind by the guidelines. Uh, there's a lot of ambiguity in those guidelines. And I believe that we've constructed a safe structure. Uh, we did it with good materials. We did it with a design. We did it with the intent of making the corner and the neighborhood looking better. Um, we, you know, there may be a, a small pinch in pedestrian traffic, but I don't think that it's, it's uh, inevitable. Uh, there was two uh, very elderly women uh, walking with walkers um, as, uh, you know, we were sitting down and talking the other day. They passed right by, no problem. There's no bump in the, the sidewalk, no nothing. They were just fine. They stopped. I think they might have even asked us a question. Um, and the response from the community has been, when are you opening? When are you opening? So nice. Thank you for what you've done at the corner. Thank you for the shrubs. Thank you for the planters. Um, and going back to the guidelines, sorry, my last thing, is that if you look at the picture, you know, Marcos is saying that there's no structure in the picture. 
Well, you know, the ambiguity leads you to say that, <clears throat> sure, there's no structure. It doesn't mean that it's illegal. All right. Uh, there's only Can one. I apologize. I, I'm very sorry to, I apologize to, for, for interrupting. This is just to, to, for Abraham. So can, can, I think we're already sort of shading into committee type stuff here in the full board meeting. So what I think the question was left over from the committee was the specific question of, does it clear the eight feet pursuant to the rules and is it compliant with that? And we've now, you know, that was what we had asked for information on. We've gotten the information that it, it it's agreed that it does meet the eight feet. You know, the other issues uh, were, were stuff that was known during the committee that we talked about then. And, and, you know, obviously relates to this sort of ongoing issue of what structures are going to be allowed in the future and on and on and on. But ultimately, you know, the question that was before us was a narrow question of just, is it compliant with the eight feet uh, rule, I believe. And so given that we know that I, I, I would like for us to, to move on. That's fair. That, that was the main question. Okay. The, uh, but uh, Marco did also raise the, the question about whether, you know, a structure is a, a pro allowed or not, but, um, well, I, I'm just going to make yeah. a motion to approve, I guess, under the circumstances, given that we know about the eight feet and if people are exercising, okay. you know, and, and again, I'll make my observation that I think, you know, sure. we've had structures with outdoor dining, and I think that's all going to get regularized, uh, as time proceeds, but, you know, for now it's, you know, compliant with the eight feet rule. Okay, great. So with that, um, uh, I will do want to go to cause before we, uh, cause it hasn't been seconded or called. So let's go to cause. The regulations, when you apply for sidewalk with DOT, you self-certify that you agree to the structure and to the diagram and clearances associated with the application. The application has nothing about the permanent structure on the sidewalk. The application shows the diagram that it shows is tables with umbrellas on the sidewalk and in the streets. Every single structure, according to the DOT rules, is illegal. And we know the DOT has done absolutely nothing for the past year and a half. So this structure is illegal. The self-certification is not valid and I am going to definitely oppose this, and we should get DOT to go out and inspect the site for what they deem to be correct. Okay, thanks, Kaz. Um, Sharon put Marshall. And just a reminder, we do have a motion to approve from Russell that has yet to be seconded. Um, I'm going to... Uh... Okay, uh, first of all, I think we need to help our small businesses. And I concur with Russell that we have already determined the eight foot rule and we should vote to support. We're in, we're transitioning and transitioning the word itself implies that we are still in a pandemic and this city is hurting. Uh, business-wise and in other ways as well. I mean, honestly, we, we just need to uh, support this and move on and we can address some of the other uh, questions in the future. Thank great. you, thank is you. That a, is that a second? Yes. Okay, great, thank yes. you. Thank Perfect. you. <laughs> okay, so we have a motion to approve and seconded. I'm gonna go to Craig, because Marco's already spoken. No question. Call the question. Okay, so uh, all in favor of calling the question, give me a thumbs up. There's a bunch. Okay, good. All right, so we can uh, call the question. I mean, all take right. the roll. Please raise your hand if you are voting no, not voting for cause or abstaining. And we'll start with cause. No, I'm voting no. We should support the businesses, but not when it's a free for all. We got it. Okay. We just have to do the voting. Uh, uh, thank you, Kaz. Marco? No. Thank you, Marco. Next up is Anthony Kong. No. 
All right. Uh, thank you, Anthony. Next is Ed Hartzog. Same. All right. Thanks, Ed. Next is Alita. No. Thank you. Um, Michelle Birnbaum. Uh, I'm going to abstain. I've been looking on the internet to try to get a picture of this, and without yeah, an sorry, image, Michelle, we I can't, can't really vote. Can't so do... I'm abstaining. Okay. Okay. Thank you. Mrs. Brown is up next. No. Thank you. Next is Sherry Weiner. No. Okay. Thank you, Sherry. Uh, next is Valerie Mason. I'm going to abstain. Okay, thank you, Valerie. Um, next, Elaine Walsh. No. Thank you, Elaine. And um, I'm sorry, did I? Alita's hand is up. Um, I did. I, I, wanted to, I wanted to change it from a no to an abstain. Thanks, Billy. Okay. Thank you. Anyone else? Okay, seeing no other hands, the resolution passes. All right, thanks. Thank you, Abraham. All right, next. Okay, uh, Women and Families Committee with uh, Gail and Peggy, please. Am I unmuted? You are. Okay. Right to the UR. Thank you. Good evening. First of all, Gail Barron and I would like to give a warm welcome to our new members. Um, at our meeting last night, we heard from five excellent speakers about the increase in domestic violence during the pandemic and the way various organizations, including the Manhattan DA's office, are addressing this problem. We also heard about a form of domestic partner abuse called coercive control. Our meeting minutes describe this pervasive form of domestic abuse, but essentially it involves an intimate partner, usually a man, forcing his female partner to do something she doesn't want to do or preventing her from engaging in activities she does want to do or having access to money. The New York State Legislature has been considering bills to make coercive control a crime in New York State, but these bills have not yet passed. Our resolution calls on the state's Assembly and Senate in its 2022 session to pass legislation making coercive control a crime in New York State, a move that would greatly help women afflicted by this scourge. A resolution passed unanimously, but we can answer any questions. Thank you very much. Sharon Pope Marshall. Sharon, you can unmute. I'm, yes, I'm sorry. Uh, call the question. Is there a second? Yes. Several. Yes, Rita. So, um, all in favor of calling the question? Anyone opposed? Okay. Uh, call the roll, please. Okay. All right. If uh, you'd like. Oh, go ahead. To if you'd like to vote no, abstain or not vote for cause, please raise your hand. Police. Abstain. Anyone else? Going once, going twice. Uh, the resolution passes 42 to 0 to 1. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. All right, so next. Wait, wait, I see Michelle. If that's a vote. Yes, sorry. I couldn't get to the control fast enough. Sorry. 
I, I'm going to abstain because I like to see a bill. So thank you. I, I'm sorry. Couldn't get to my hand fast That's enough. Okay. okay, so it passes 41 uh, to zero to two. Thank you. All right, thank you both. So next we are going to go to the budget committee and I'm gonna turn it over to Felice and Barbara Chalky, but we, for this discussion, we're gonna go into executive session because it relates to um, personnel issues and uh, salaries and such. Yeah. So Will is going to, um, take all the board members into a breakout room, which will effectively be uh, executive session. And I will just observe for the members of the public that this is the last item on our agenda. So you may not want to stick around because I expect that we'll probably just adjourn once we're done with this uh, committee portion. So, um, but in any event, um, so Will, if you can take us into the breakout room for executive session, please. Sorry about that. It's going to take a couple seconds to get everybody into the room. Okay. But this you, is for, yeah. Go ahead. Go ahead. Oh. I was going to say everyone will receive, everyone who is a board member will receive a prompt on their device to move over to the breakout room. I believe if you're on the phone, it'll automatically move you. You can go ahead, Russell. Uh, I was just going to say that. I, I didn't get the. Uh, it's it hasn't come through yet. yet. It hasn't come through yet. Oh, okay. And this brief delay, this is really for uh, simulation of real life conditions. You know, if we were in person uh, for this meeting, you know, it would take a few minutes for the public to leave so we could be in executive session. So we really wanted to make sure that that realism came through here in Zoom. So okay. here we go. Everyone should have the option to leave if you are supposed to. Saida, you're in charge. Oh, Jane, Peter, follow the prompt.
can solve the problem. Oh, yeah. Yeah, and then there's little like a gerbils that uh they sit inside the little holes, and then they go like [noise] and like [noise] Go lay down. [noise] Hey, well, uh, so you invited me to leave the breakout room. No one can unmute themselves. So if you're gonna invite us both back and maybe change that function. Oh, my gosh, I was muted. How about that? Um, so <laughs> God, um, oh, that was recorded. Uh, you guys are getting sent back. And um, you should be a co host now. So you should have the ability. Okay. Got it. I okay. will test by unmuting Rami. Oh, no, I see that it comes up. Yeah, yeah, you, you should have the ability. So I'm gonna reassign people to the breakout room. Everyone is calling me, which is great. Um, why, why are you not being able, can you, can you leave on your own? Rebecca? Leave the, I leave the breakout room. No, you're not in the breakout room. Can you go to the breakout room right yeah. now? I don't see how. Oh, wait, see. Uh, I can broadcast my message to all. No, you should be able to join. <sighs> Everyone is calling me. I know um, them calling me is not going to solve the problem. Russell. Uh, you hey. I tried you to make. Can yeah, you uh, unmute Rami? He has yep. a suggestion, I guess. Go for yeah. it, Rami. Yeah, I'm I'm on my phone and my other my computer's unmuted in the breakout room. It's the only account that I can talk to everyone. But I have a breakout room invite on my phone right now. So yes. try promoting try promoting my phone to great. It, it might be called the same thing. Yep. It's co host and I have to unhide it from so you should be a co host now, as well as Rebecca, okay. but I can't send Rebecca back to the room for some reason. Okay, I'm going to the room. Let's see if this works. Oh, because I think I've already tried to assign her. Rebecca, is there a button open somewhere on your screen? I'm looking. I don't see any. Um... Russell, you're also a co-host, and you're okay. I'm being invited to join the breakout. Yep, go. Oh, found it.
Gail, do you need back in or? Yeah, thumbs up. I I I, I see. For some reason, it's not showing me the ability to send you in. Oh, it just says you haven't joined. I'll unmute you, but look for a button, like probably hidden under other stuff on your screen that would say to join the meeting. If not, leave the meeting and come back and it'll reset that problem.
Should I just close the breakout room, force everyone back? Yep. You have 60 seconds until everyone's forced back. The only two people still in there are second Rami and second you, Russell. Great, okay. Okay, so um, I saw there were some hands up, including Lori actually, I think, had her hand up first. So I'm gonna call on Lori. Okay. Recording in progress. In progress. Sorry. Can you unmute Lori, please? I tried. Hi. Hi. Um, okay. Thank you for uh, for calling on me. Um, just very briefly, um, the I, I think about you know when when women go for um, job interviews, uh, there were uh, there there was a, a law passed you know recently where they uh, you couldn't ask how much they made. So, um, and that was to bring women's salaries more in line with men's salaries. So my question is- but Let me wait, wait, uh, sorry, wait, I, I, just, I, I apologize. Before we do this, so I, and I should have checked on this beforehand, but we're now, we're, we're back in public session here. So we're not in the, we're not in the breakout session or we're not in executive session anymore. So to the extent that this relates to the specifics of personnel discussions, you know, we're, 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 we're out of the, the executive session so i would just uh, okay uh, that's fine i mean i don't think i'm going to be violating anything i'm just asking a question okay yep, go ahead. which is how much was max making no that's am i allowed to ask that no i'm not allowed to ask that not it has to be an executive session so i'm sorry we left executive session already right, so that's a but I, I can tell you what it was offline it was discussed uh, Okay. Well, anyway, all right. So, but the, the point is um, that I believe that the the, the um, it should be based on the position, not based on what what someone was was making before. Um, so, so yeah. okay. And I would have made a motion, but I can't do that now because we're not in executive session. But I mean that for for making the the equity question. Yeah. You know, so yeah, yeah. That's, that's 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 what I think we should do. Anyway, all right, go ahead. That that's right. it. I'm done. Let's let's. So I I can. Why don't we talk separately, and I'll I'll say what I would have said if we were in executive session. Um, and and so I see there's a bunch of hands up. Uh, I'm very cognizant of the time. And I'm also again cognizant of the fact that we're now out of executive session. So what I would say is, unless uh, there are, um, you basically don't don't say stuff that you would have to have said in an executive session at a minimum. But let, let me go to Wilma Johnson who has her hand up. So Wilma, you can unmute with star six. Go ahead, wait, no, yes. I would like to find out if we can possibly move the agenda because it's after midnight. Yeah, is that a motion to adjourn? Of course. Yes, Rami seconds. There's a lot of uh, hands up. Okay, so that's we're we're gonna just do that. Okay. So, um, okay. Thank you, everybody, and uh, sorry for the long meeting.